Chain of Lakes uh, History and Science Program. Uh, wow, what a great turnout. And on a, on a nice day this morning, I thought, well, good, it's raining and it'll be a, a good impetus for people to get out and uh, do something. And then it turned beautiful. And so thanks for coming out on a beautiful afternoon. Uh, I'm Mike Scholdice, and I uh, started putting this program together a few years ago. Uh, you know, in part, we are so lucky to live where we live or, or visit. Uh, I don't know how many of you are visitors, but, you know, we have the cleanest water on earth. And um, we will be the envy of everybody on earth. I mean, how many people on earth don't have clean water? And we have an abundance of clean water. And, uh, you know, one of my thoughts was the Turtle River doesn't really have an identity around the fact that it, how it, it, that it is the home of a chain of lakes. And, and so there are all these lakes in Winchester and Mercer that are connected. And we all uh, should be aware of what's upstream from us. And we have a responsibility to send clean water downstream to our neighbors. And, and there are challenges. Uh, you know, like I say, we have incredibly clean water in this part of the world, um, but we, we are, we're struggling in, in some of the spots as well. So this program is sponsored uh, by the Rice Lake Association and for the benefit of the Rice Lake Association, who is in the middle of a Herculean effort to get control of uh, curly leaf pondweed, uh, an invasive species that they're, that they're fighting drastically. With. So the donation bucket on the back um, uh, table, uh, if you've got an extra couple of bucks or a uh, or a 20 or a 50 or whatever you might have, don't hesitate to uh, donate to the Rice Lake Association in their effort to, to fight curly leaf pondweed. And, and of course, it's not just Rice Lake Association because it moves with the river and it is already moving downstream towards the uh, Turtle Flambeau flowage. And so we, it would be uh, horrific if it landed there. There's a number of people here from the Rice Lake Association. Um, Dick uh, Thede is in the back of the room, Bonnie Banasek is here, Rita Carey is here. Um, and so seek them out and talk to them about uh, their, their challenge and, and what kind of help they need because part of our, uh, part of our mission is to help our neighbors. And, and to, it'd be nice to see the lake associations and the people who care about the Turtle River Chain of Lakes uh, pitch in and, and uh, help where, um, where they can. We've got four experts this afternoon to talk to us about the, their field of study. Um, first up is gonna be Jim Bokern, who's the president of the Matchwish Waters um, Historical Society. And, and Jim is gonna talk about the Turtle River as a superhighway. Uh, second up is Jamie Vann. Jamie's in, in the back. And Jamie's from the North Lakeland Discovery Center. Um, and she, the, the Discovery Center, Natchez Waters, has spent a lot of time and effort uh, in the Headlock Lakes, North and South Turtle, Rock Lake. Don't know if they've been up on uh, No Man's, but, um, uh, but they've, done, they've been working on the Turtle River chain for years. So Jamie's going to talk about the Headwater Lakes and the efforts that the Discovery Center focuses on. Uh, third up is Zach Wilson from the Iron County Land and Water Conservation Department. And the Iron County Land and Water Conservation Department has done a lot of work over the years on the Turtle River chain in Iron County. And, and, and you should, if, if you're an Iron County resident and you haven't met the professionals at the Iron County Land and Water Conservation Department, uh, you should get to know them. They're a uh, wealth of resource and, and uh, information. Uh, Fourth speaker is Zach Lawson. Zach is the fisheries biologist for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, stationed here in Mercer. And I, and I credit Zach for the uh, kernel of the idea. We've been meeting with him several years ago um, uh, about the Spider Lake fishery. And he made a kind of an offhanded comment. He said, I've been on all the lakes on the Turtle River 
and the fisheries are remarkably similar. And then he paused and he said, well, there's differences between, you know, some are deeper and some are shallower. And I, and I said, I looked across the table and said, well, that would make an interesting presentation in itself, the, the, the similarities and differences in the, in the fishery. And then we'll wrap the program up um, uh, with panel discussion and, and encourage your questions. I, I'd like to ask you to hold your questions until the end, because I've asked the speakers who could all, who are all capable of speaking for several hours on the topic that they're expert in. I've asked them to hold their presentations to 30 minutes so that we can um, wrap up by six o'clock. So without any further uh, comments, um, I'll turn it over to Jim Boker. Thank you. Hi, for those who don't know me, my name is Jim Boker. Uh, I've been doing a lot of research in this area. I got formally started when I did my master's thesis on the lack of flammable band of the Ojibwe and the canoe routes and historic villages. And it was all about the Turtle River. So I'm happy to share that and everything that I've learned in the last 30 years to help you understand more about this amazing water resource that has deep historic roots. And right away, we can see an 1880s map of the Turtle River in itself, and then a 1900 map. Uh, both of these are from the State Historical Society, the access um, that really illustrate this as a super highway for uh, Native Americans, indigenous communities, and loggers. I want you to think about how we look at the county trunks and our highways today. And then let's flip it back to 1889 when the railroad first came through here. And then in 1905, the spurs were driven from Winchester to Fosterville and all the way to Buswell. These were competing railroads acting like a giant pincer to try to grab the last virgin timber in these regions that are in the Turtle River. But I want you to go further back than that. The thousands of years and before 1889, these are our corridors of travel. The Flambeau Trail from Lake Superior, where you are right now, the Turtle Portage Trail, we are sitting on it. The Six Paws Portage from Mercer to the Manitouche River, and then this portage route to Rest Lake from South Turtle. Those were the highways, and the rest was done by water primarily. And that's going to be the focus of what we're going to be looking at. So, an overview of the Flambeau Trail and the Porty Trout starts up here at Lake Superior, where the Red Arrow is on the Michigan side of the river, and it ends up here at Long Lake, getting into your water source. Down here is the Turtle Band and the Turtle Portage Band. It's an 1846 map from A.B. Gray, a geologist that went through this area. And no longer have control. Oh, sorry. I'm trying to answer a chat online. <laughs> there we go. All right. So the Flambeau Trail in yellow right here to this corridor of access was one of only five throughout the UP and Wisconsin. Okay. And this was the most well documented and the most heavily used. That's important. In 1843, the Turtle Portage Band, which is right in Mercer, right over there between here and Grand Portage Lake, literally, um, had 16 families, 68 residents. All right. So this gives you some context uh, very well here. This is um, Norwood's 1847 map. I've got a copy of that leaning over right there. And there's a copy of it at the Manitowish Waters Library. You can find it at the Wisconsin Historical Society as well. There we go. I'm back. And so here's the Turtle Portage Band. My research was on Flambeau, Trout Lake, Wisconsin River, Lake Vita Sierra, Pelican Lake. Those were all the bands in this area that were Ojibwa. This is the primary corridor. This is the secondary corridor of travel. So right now I'm trying to contextualize you that you're in some important ground historically and how things roll. And uh, here's that Owens map that's in the back. And so you have uh, Turtle Portage here, Six Paws, the Rust Lake to South Trout Portage. All of these are marked on historic maps. They're absolutely valid. valid. 
and have journal entries to support them. I'll be sharing some. So let's go all the way back to uh, Lake Superior. This is an image of Superior Falls and looks remarkably the same. And from there, they took a 40 plus mile travel, 144 pause portage. A pause is just a place where they stop because they're double packed for voyagers and go back and forth. So that's how you make your three day trek over this thing. And here is Long Lake. So take a look at that image of Long Lake right there at the end of the portage. And here is, uh, didn't get in here, I'm sorry. I must have copied a different, I had a picture of Long Lake that I was gonna show you. But this looks similar to what Long Lake looks like um, up in Northern Iron County. All right, so Ojibwe travel with guides came in uh, a variety of ways. They uh, used birch bark canoes, sometimes dugout canoes. And the way that they handled rapids is that they would actually create a shoe of a, um, Ribbings of cedar that they would put around them. So you may say, how do they get these heavily laden birch bark canoes up the Turtle River, you know, between Echo Lake and Oxbow without uh, destroying their canoes? Um, and that's how they did it. And they did not carry their canoes to uh, on the Flambeau Trail. And they actually cached special canoes from the interior lakes up by uh, Portage Lake, we'll talk about that more a little bit later, and use Great Lakes canoes uh, in getting to the Great Lakes. Want to talk about women portaging uh, more as well. In the interior lakes, the Ojibwa would be then moving into communities where they had seasonal camps. Um, as we go back, the stories are many about this, and women carry heavy, heavy loads, and were seen as being more reliable by several accounts than men in carrying their portages. Women of 70 years of age were carrying 90 pound hats. Women would carry, adult women who were not that old would carry 100 to 150 pound hats and manage their children. My favorite one was uh, from a journal from the Allen Expedition 1832 to the St. Croix area. The U.S. Army was going in and doing the trip down these portages, and the, the, the Army soldiers are exhausted and laying back against stumps, and this young girl is carrying a keg of 1,000 musket balls over her head in knee-deep sludge in a swamp and just goes right by them like a bullet. <laughs> so when you think of this, it is really quite important to understand those contexts of how hard it was to travel, that this is a community effort. And this is an image of what a Ojibwa summer, fall, uh, and maybe spring residence would look like. So for thousands of years, uh, fur trade and fur trade goods were brought to this area. Flambeau Trail getting off at Portage Lake and coming here to uh, Six Paws Portage. Many of these artifacts are available for you to see at the George Brown Museum in the dugout canoe that they found next to Strawberry Island. Traps, shovel, axes are all in there and replicas of the birch bark boats that I've been giving you examples of. So here's a weird deal. On the way down from here, you're leaving your boats right there from the Great Lakes and you need a new boat here. And so you cash them in the woods. Believe it or not, people would take your boats. <laughs> they would hide your boats. And we get so little information from journals because there really, really wasn't much written. But what we get a lot about the upper part of the turtle around Portage Lake is they're always looking for cash boats. They have to stop and make their cedar paddles. There's this transition of going from the superior basin to into the interior lake basin. So as a result, and we have evidence in 1892 that the Chippewa Indians secured birch bark for their canoe making on the north shore of Spider Lake. They were making those canoes here and then making them available because these are things you can barter for because walking from Portage Lake to Lac de Flambeau or Long Lake today is not really a plausible venture. And so, uh, again, this would be one of the things that you may want to uh, explore more. It's interesting, we found uh, these birch bark trees. There's only 
two recorded sites and maybe one more in the whole state of Wisconsin. This is in Manitowoc Waters, where some of the tribes constructed and repaired canoes, virgin timber, yet stand show, the scarifications, just like this, from tapping their trees to get the resins and tears to make the pitch for those birch bark boats. We had this right in that area. And these are things to look around for. They're almost always red pines, by the way. Much of this was driven for, by trappers and the media for all trapping was the flue, one beaver skin. It was a form of commerce, like $4, four plues. This is an exchange model. So here's from Malia. We have this journal from 1804. It says, I traded with them, got four beaver, two otters, um, uh, one beaver and two dress moose skins. I gave them on credit plus five plues. You see how that's the currency? By the way, this is a uh, picture of a moose in Iron County uh, about a month ago. So I put that in there so you can use that to imagine moose skins and hides and the like. So the use of snares and traps, the Ojibwe did all the trapping and um, the voyagers, they were like UPS. They did logistics, okay? They hauled things in and out. They were not doing any other work. So here they are doing their UPS routine and doing logistics, okay? They're not the hunter trappers. Nor was the geologist in 47 said, Turtle Portage is an excellent one, a plain line between the two turtle lakes. That's Echo and Grand Portage. That's right where we are, my friends. He said the outlet of the Turtle Lake is, uh, is a very narrow channel connecting with the other one. So all the fur trade goods going in and all the furs going out went underneath the beak of Clare Bloom right there in that river area and all the way up to Portage Lake. Ojibwa villages um, are important here. First, Mercer or Turtle Portage and then Camp Red Arrow or the Trout River Band of the Ojibwe were staging areas where they drove the Dakota Sioux out of Lac and Flambeau. So again, the turtle um, lakes were a road to war, if you will, as far as logistics for the Chippewa. One of the things they talked about here is um, they have potatoes and corn being raised at the village. And here are some pictures of potatoes and corn. Uh, potatoes, ironically, come from Peru, go to the fur trade, and then end up back up here and become a super food source for the Ojibwe. They would literally, in their wigwams right over here, uh, take them, parboil them, peel them, and then put them on basswood string and dehydrate them in their wigwams, and they was storable food for winter. It's really quite amazing. Well, what we need to see is wild rice from the Nome. Um, Modern historians have erred in thinking that what drove the Ojibwa to come to this region uh, was the fur trade. Uh, modern scholars, and particularly indigenous scholars, say no way it was wild rice because you can't have a fur trade if you don't have storable food for winter. So that is primary. All villages are right by rice areas. I'm in trouble with Sorry. Sorry. I'm trying to squeeze in my comments in between your slides. That's okay. <laughs> we can work together. All right. So here we see uh, the white rice is then processed and then uh, put in storable containers so it can be cached. So here at Mercer, you have Rice Lake right here, which is absolutely important in close proximity here. You will find this relationship with all those village points I showed you before. And then right here, Mercer Lake used to be called Maple Lake. And this is all the... Um, traditional seasonal activities right in this context here, right in this uh, region. This is a famous Seth Eastman lithograph of an Ojibwe sugar bush. We have one identified uh, in Winchester, right on Windman Trails uh, historically. And this is what, how they would open big wounds and they would use the spiles a little differently than we do today. These berries, cranberries and uh, blueberries were taken on six paws portage right here in Iron County, they would gather them. The fur traders would barter with the Ojibwe and the classic fur trade driven by European markets collapsed in 1847. Uh, that was a European thing. 
Um, then other people came to the region who were non-Indigenous as well as Indigenous folks. They all started to trap. I took this one from the Chippewa River, but it was Peter Vance in 1884. He said, we killed as many as 100 wildcats in a single winter, sometimes only using a club. As they're logging, they're pushing these animals into less and less force, you understand? And there's an intensity that takes place in these logging practices. Trapping traditions continue on the Turtle River Lakes. Here we have two uh, guys, George Laporte, uh, Manitwish, and uh, Richard Slate Jr. showing both uh, post-World War I and post-World War II trapping traditions that are, are still continuing on these areas. Ojibwa ice spirit and netting was also used within these winter months with uh, decoys that were made specifically to bring in the muskies and they were hit with a heavy spear. This is a display of like the flambeau. Fayette Buck was the individual who did a lot of work in this area. This is a 1900 map that he drew. Here's Mercer right here. Buck is interesting. He was uh, interviewed and then Huff, a writer for Forest and Stream Magazine, went in the field with him in the height of winter in 1895. We have five articles on their exploits, one of which is at Mercer right here. And he, call, he calls them Winnebago's. They were Ojibwe. Uh, we're fond of ice fishing, spearing, and the jaw bones of many musculans showed up and they were successful here. That was being done on Grand Portage Lake. So you know the Ojibwa were still here as the railroad was and was co-mingling with the loggers and others at the time. Over at Winchester, here's that portage that goes from South Turtle all the way to Rust Lake. And here's that little spur that goes to that sugar bush that goes to the sugaring activities, all happening within your watershed. We can go back to 1862 field survey notes to mark the trail and the sugar bush. And here it is right through Windman. There's the portage, there's the sugar bush. So again, these activities and the, the travel of the Ojibwa through the area are key. Sadly, Fayabuck um, was a confrontationalist with a lot, but particularly the Ojibwe. Uh, he bragged in some of his uh, 1905 promotional material. Not a single Indian has made a trip up the river for 12 years because he threatened to kill them with set guns in the woods. Uh, kind of breaking down the relationships that other communities have with indigenous families. But if you want to know more about indigenous communities, I would welcome you to go to the Ojibwa Museum and Cultural Center in Lake of Flambo, run by Teresa Mistral. It is absolutely fantastic. And here I did a class on the Flambeau Trail and uh, Hedda made this wonderful trip ticket of Mercer and Six Paws Portage. And Teresa did a lot of the tech and all this for you. But uh, it, there's a walking trail that she actually made that brings out all the life for you to better understand. So one of the other things that we see as we get into the logging era, the Army Corps of Engineers was here in 1878. I have this map also back over there from my home for you to look at. And this shows the whole turtle uh, area and their proposed dam sites. Buck had a road that went to his divide camp, linking to Mercer. And when we look at these plats, starting in 1898, I just used Oxbow Lake in uh, Townline 43's uh, range four as an example. You see ownership changes. Chippewa Lumber and Boom, that's River Drive right off of Oxbow. 1903, a few different players are in here. Brooks and Ross. But as we look at phase one logging, which is only white pine logs being driven down river, um, we see this document in WPA histories of Mercer. The dams were at between Oxbow and Spider, Spider and Fisher, Rice and Pike Lake. And there was another one at uh, Lake of the Falls. And this is how they held back the water and they pushed those logs downstream. And these are the river rats that made them move, all white pine. So they would. The sawyers would work felling and moving the trees in the winter in the snow. They would buck them on sleds or on go devils. 
being drawn by horses. And then they would deck them by the river and then put them in and they would jack up the water level below the dams and they would drive them down. So the Turtle River was used for this extensively. Modern image of Shea Dam kind of shows you a legacy of this river drive logging period on the Turtle. Phase two logging uses railroad. Like I said before, you hear you have bus well, this is not to the Turtle um, River and lakes but it was competing to get to this area. This again is the um, Chicago Northwestern going up to the Foster River. As we look at this uh, around Winchester, these are all the, uh, the, the companies that were in that area. And then if we go back to the 1912 uh, plat map, I just stuck with Oxbow Lake as, as a pattern going through. Uh, you can see again, it's changing even more. You see, you see Shea's name up here again, Shea the Flambeau Lumber Company and a lot. Um, probably the best example would be Winchester, Wisconsin. Here's a 1938 aerial view of Winchester. You can still see the railroad area, the crossing here, the mill, the town. And here's a modern uh, map of it as well. Um, it is right here on this arm that was started in 1905. Okay, and then it went up to Fosterville. This actually drives a lot of resort development, uh, certainly. So here's that lumber mill that I told you about, and they used uh, the lake as a hot pond. They would actually bring the logs in, dump them in the lake like a hot pond, and then drag them up into the sawmill, and then make the lumber and ship the lumber down. This is actually a train running from uh, Presque Isle down to Winchester. The Turtle Lumber Company was kind of interesting. They used uh, railroad cars, and we see this a lot as I do my research on railroad groups. They would get double and triple wide areas, and they'll pull in their administrative car, a bunkhouse car, and a mess hall car, and they can move them very quickly from place to place by just opening the tracks, and uh, they leave a pretty good footprint coming back. But how about snow? You want to talk about good old days snow? Think about what it was like living in Winchester in those company town houses. Um, Winchester uh, was a company town. Uh, Weingart was such a company town, they had their own currency. So you were held there almost in peonage, okay? You indebtedness. You couldn't leave with your money and go somewhere else because it could only be spent in the company store, all right? So you were kind of held to your work. Uh, but I love these pictures. And this one I just got from Leonard Shields who came here. And uh, this was a great quote. So Main Street, this is Mercer. There was Patty Ryan Saloon and a hotel, uh, Ruggy and Grant Stores, McGinnis Saloon and the like. We had a branch track running north of town to mill towns known then as Winchester and Fosterville. There was one train daily and saloon keepers as they were then called named the train the meal ticket because it brought the lumberjacks into town with their paychecks and that meant big business so they had to uh, barter back and forth so there's a, a robust river drive and railroad connection right up and down the the, uh, the turtle chain and river to be sure and here's some examples of uh, the, the railroads now I know I was just supposed to talk about that, and I think I still have like nine minutes, if I'm correct here. Um, I wanted to talk about how this influenced tourism, because tourism happened simultaneously with logging, all right? It, it was at the same point. So in 1892, they're advertising the Turtle River to bring people up here to fish, all right? As soon as these railroad camps are in, they're involved. Here we have Mercer and Turtle Waters. It was kind of, this was called Turtle Waters. And then the town in 1895 was formed and they decided to honor a revolutionary general named John Mercer instead of the traditional turtle recognition. So Winchester took Turtle Lakes and it kind of went that way. But they had all the discussion of all the lakes, Echo, Oxbow, Fisher, Mud, Grouse, Turtle, Rock, No Man's, and they were, this is the Chicago Northwest Western, selling people to come north and try things out. 
George uh, Buck and, uh, and Fayette Buck were the two that really drove a lot of this. By 1921, he was one of the best trappers in the area. Like I said, he was with Forest and Stream at Mercer. He lived and worked. This is in 1895. He caught seven lynx, five hour, otter, 65 martin, seven fox, four fishers, 40 mink, 700 muskrats. That was a pull down of cash of about $500. A laborer in 1900 would make under $500 per year with the work of factory. And these guys were doing this collectively at that time. He talked about a camp along a heavily timbered Garrows in the Turtle Lakes. And that's where Bucks is today in the famous Divide Resort. And he used a lot of advertising and he did a lot of outreach. This is a really good document that goes into a lot of detail about the turtle waters. He named turtle waters. He branded Manitouish waters as well. And he has a lot of uh, evidence from people who've been there and other statements. Um, these are all the camps that he had right in the areas that you are interested in researching. He got in there and uh, he also served as a guide and this is when he had his conflict with the Ojibwe. Now for the Ojibwe, this is where they had traditionally been for generations and Buck comes in and, and threatens them. Buck also had his divide resort and then they had an old trail that came here and that was another way to get in from the railroad. But that was the Divide Resort. It was grand. Look at the interior. He had a whole collection of mounts, sailboats. Here he is landing a giant muskie. There was another resort that his father and, and brother ran, and that was right across from Greer's Pier, and it was another massive resort. They were at it. So this is a family photo of the Bucks about 1910. I have a 14 month granddaughter and I read her books as long as she'll pay attention. And there's always one, what doesn't fit here? So you have everybody in Victorian guard and their Sunday best and two guys with <laughs> sleeveless shirts on and they're drinking, okay? There's Fayette Buck glaring at his wife and there's Neil. They're both going to abandon their entire family in a matter of seven years and never come back again. And the whole thing is going to collapse. Just as a couple of asides, we discovered and have shared with libraries this fictional book, The King of Nobody's Island, written in 1909. And I'm convinced this fictional story the ending point is in the Turtle River Basin. And if you have not read this, you should. <coughs> they come in from land to lakes from state line, but they talk about the families that uh, they get all their provisions from Manitowich. And it's all fiction. And uh, this is what it looks like. It has some uh, characters that may be linking to early pioneers. And the story arc goes from Chicago up to that area. And these are all the points that are cited on it. I think it's right here on uh, No Man's Lake. Another thing as I come to close, we found in Outer's Magazine, published in 1918, two articles. And I haven't done the lower turtle. Before the turtle flambeau flowage dam was put in, in the mid 1920s, these guys took trips down the Turtle River. This is the basin that you go over on the Turtle Flambeau flowage. And these are men lining canoes through the rapids that used to be in that area. That's exactly what it looked like. So the next time you're all going through there and you're looking at your locator as you go through one of these river channels, this is what you're looking at. Isn't that cool? And uh, then, they went down to Lake of the Falls. And here's the dam at Lake of the Falls. But look at all the remnant logs that are left behind from the river drive logging. This is 1918. All serious river drive logging ends, you know, 1910, 12 period. So these things have just kind of been there for a while. The rest are all going out of the railroad. 
but these are kind of fun to understand your basic. So the Turtle River routes here, 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 and here are so important. They link to these communities so strongly historically. You have your own indigenous community here, and you were the conduit of travel for the whole area. Your history is impressive, and hopefully you will be like me, and you will be motivated to preserve it, because I can promise you there are people who are interested in going out there and collecting it and selling it on eBay, or selling it on eBay, or keeping it as their own private possessions. And just a flash of the back, and Rolf is here. Oh, it's not on this. I, I put an old one. I had a picture of me in 2000 on the Turtle River with a digital time traveler kids uh, in a birch bark boat that was fairly somewhere yet. But I put up an older version. I'm supposed to be done. And you're supposed to hold your questions. All right. Thank you. Jim. And, uh, and a couple of quick reminders did everybody get a chance to sign in? The uh, Rice Lake Association is, is using um, this forum as an educational forum, and your time that you're spending here will be monetized and used as part of their in kind uh, donation to the grants that they've received from the DNR. Um, the Rice Lake Association has also provided uh, snacks, cookies, and coffee. So help yourself. Um, and while Jamie is set up, I just again, I just wanted to emphasize that uh, the North Lakeland Discovery yeah. Center and the Manitowish Waters Historical Society that uh, the Jim represents are two incredible nonprofit organizations. Um, later in the program, we'll talk about two governmental agencies, the Iron County Land and Water Conservation and the Wisconsin DNR there, all represented here. But, Jamie? Thanks. Um, so my name is Jamie Van. I'm the water program director at the North Lakeland Discovery Center. Um, many of you are probably familiar with the Discovery Center, have likely been there, um, especially if you've been in the community in the area for a long time. I would hope today, or I would bet that you're going to learn a little bit more about what our, our center offers in terms of helping protect our lakes in the area and some of the work that we do that maybe you don't get when you walk into the Sierra Nature Center and attend one of our educational programs on the regular. Um, my experience, um, I appreciate being called an expert, but I've only been here since March. So some people might be like, how is she really an expert in the area? So my family um, relocated here. We live in Nashville Waters. We moved up from the Lake Geneva Genoa City area where I was working in Milwaukee. Um, I was a Northland College student uh, with a bachelor's in biology and natural resources. From there, I had some really fun jobs, traveled through the country to work on these academia type research projects, um, often related to something with salamanders or fisheries. And then I worked for the Illinois Natural History Survey for a couple years in Illinois. That's when I started really getting more focused on water related projects in science. Largely, we did inland game fish research, um, a lot of uh, pipe netting and water quality analysis and data collection and zooplankton, and then Asian carp work on the Illinois River. So, working with invasive species and collecting data for the Asian carp invasion down there. After that, I had another um, job in between that and where I just came from, working for a lake and pond restoration company where we had an aquatic greenhouse and we grew a lot of marginal aquatic plant species. Those are the plants that have your feet wet in the water, but they're growing up out of it. So your shoreline restoration plants. So I really started getting into more um, plant diversity and plant communities. And as a restoration ecologist for the firm where I was just working, um, I was doing a lot of habitat restoration through Milwaukee. It's a whole different world down there. Invasive species are like, every corner, every turn, county roads, right of ways, all over the bluffs, everywhere that people have been, because that's one of the large, you know, ways that they spread. So I learned a lot working on the bluffs too for erosion control. We were um, restoring a lot of habitats along Lake Michigan um, from what was long ago CCC projects of uh, graded in roads to access from the water up on top of the land. They've got these very steep bluffs. 
um, back to nat native and natural habitat while stabilizing them with biodegradable erosion control materials. We were a design build firm as well for landscaping. So putting in some really cool amenities for humans to enjoy these spaces and finding these balances of what we wanted as people in our habitats to coexist with the ecology of this beautiful corridor that was so important along Lake Michigan because it was non-fragmented connected habitat for migration in a city like the size of Milwaukee where people don't necessarily understand the impact of that. Um, so that's where a lot of the experience I have comes from and we moved up here because we wanted to be in places like this, like this type of a community where people show up um, and want to be a part of protecting and enhancing and, and finding their place in harmony with that community of life that we value uh, why most of us are here. So the Discovery Center, I just want to recap. Um, what we do there is we have memberships. You can be a member. Um, there's some benefits to that. We have educational programming. So folks can come for adult or child programming. We have schools that come to our center. Um, we go out and teach adults as well. We lead hikes, um, all nature-based programming. And then our facilities, which we're expanding right now, literally expanding growth and capacity. Um, we do host events and um, educational forums and meetings and stuff like that too. Um, the water program, is, I'm the water program director. So what the water program does is works as a lead partner in our network of professionals throughout the North Woods in the state um, to manage our earth for clean water. Our program strives to make our content relatable to all ages and knowledge levels through educational staff who teach the importance of caring for our Earth's natural resources. On this slide, you'll see photos of the seasonal staff that come through our program. Um, they're not just freshmen in college. Often this year it was four, uh, four of the five are graduates um, who had finished their school, all had bachelors, many were going back for a master's. And these students are entering the career field as young adults and professionals doing real work, real research, and real habitat management um, on our bodies of water through the area. Um, they're teaching students in the bottom corner from Illinois who are coming up for a Center of Conservation Leadership. We participate in Clean Boats, Clean Waters. In the bottom left, that's actually us out hand weeding and gardening the bottom of the lake bed of Rice Lake um, up here in Iron County as we're helping with curly leaf control. Um, we offer all kinds of services to the area, and this is where I think a lot of people don't know that this is an aspect of the Discovery Center and what we can contribute to our area and the partners that we work with. Um, I'll get into our relationship with Winchester, who I think is just a wonderful example of the effort given there um, to protect their area lakes and a good model for how a community can come together um, to make that happen. Um, we have in the past done a lot of contracting and consulting to help these larger firms like Ontera or Aquatic Plant Management Inc. to come and do this work, but we have the capacity and the experience and the professionals to do it now as well. So we're out doing point inter intercept surveys. That's a way to monitor vegetation as the DNR protocol in a lake. Um, Lake level monitoring, we have one of the largest and longest running lake level monitoring programs in the country. Um, that was established with Child Lake Station Center of Limnology. Um, we do grant writing and sponsorship as a nonprofit. It's a wonderful place to be in a sweet spot between governmental agencies and private residences and private um, entities where you can help sponsor grants um, and act as that liaison for them. Uh, shoreline restoration, as I said, my specialty was really um, working with natural materials to help restore shorelines in native plant communities and specializing in some of the um, complexes for areas to make them really hardy while benefiting ecological life in the area. Um, so this is just a good variety of services we do offer, um, educational programs as well. You're going to hear a lot about aquatic invasive species. We don't really have enough time to tell you all about aquatic invasive species. So if you're someone who's interested in that, the Discovery Center, we host several programs at the Rest Lake um, boat launch across from the Discovery Center and Manage Waters. You can come out in the summertime, sit down with us, and we'll go through all the different species 
what they are, how to identify them, and what to do when you find them. So those are some of the other services we offer as well, um, and that you'll find as events in, in your communities here. So to get into Winchester, the work we're doing with them um, largely is focused on aquatic invasive species, we call it AIS, surveying the shorelines um, and the littoral zones of all the water, body, water bodies in Winchester. When I say Winchester, some of you might be thinking we're on the, the turtle chain here, but some of those lakes, all but one are really in your watershed. Harris Lake drains to the Great Lakes. But the rest that we're going to talk about here are in your watershed, and many of them are in that turtle chain, including um, Rock Lake, North Turtle, and South Turtle, which I'll get to with some of the projects that we worked on up there. Um, we've been providing education and training to lake associations and residents on AIS. So, for example, um, on Harris Lake, as we we're out there to pull curly pond we, we let the residents know when we're coming, and a lot of them will come and meet us on the water, learn how to ID it help us look for it, actually do the pulling with us and be involved in their own lake management. Um, not only are they learning the conservation and you know the ethic and care for doing that, but their hours help contribute to the funding that brings the, the, the ability of us to be completing this work. So that volunteer and kind contribution is always counted. And us as a discovery center, as we work with Winchester, we help monitor and track all those volunteer hours throughout the community to make sure that we have record of them and keep them for future grants as well. Um, and keeping a GIS database of all the known AS populations and locations, SWIMS is somewhere that they all get uploaded to. So we are also coordinating that with the state of Wisconsin, their database, and keeping our own as well and creating maps to show property owners and to bring to the Town Lakes Committee. WTLC, the Winchester Town Lakes Committee, um, that exactly is a great model for what this could be. And with that, I just want to thank you for being here right now, because that's one of the first steps is just showing up, being here in a room together and figuring out what are the next steps? Where else do I come and listen to you? What can I do to help? Um, what kind of structure can we give initiatives like this? Um, that Town Lakes Committee in Winchester is an association member from all the lake associations and all the lakes, sometimes they'll pair a couple together, coming to our room once a month and sitting down together and talking about issues in their community, like Curly Leaf Pondweed that we have here. Um, beaver dams, where are they? Is the water high or low? Um, launches, was there anything that's happened at any of the launches recently? Do we need more signage? Are there any AIS or boat launch signs missing? And that also has them, um, provides them the ability to help their town board and town officials rely on somebody who's knowledgeable and has the structure um, that's dependable in their community looking out for their lake. So they work closely with the town as well um, to do that. And the town supervisor is often at both of these um, participating in so as a discovery center, we um, will also represent and show up to these meetings with them um, and provide expertise on ecological issues, um, opin opinions as well, um, and then also helping coordinate these volunteer efforts and getting your volunteers from these lake associations to show up at these meetings are one way to do that. Um, so usually between March or April through about October, they're meeting once a month for about an hour up at the library to discuss these issues. Um, the restoration um, and private residence works that we've done in Winchester as well. Um, we will meet with property owners to look at their shoreline needs and concerns. This largely affects your bodies of water in your lakes. So this is initiatives also that the town and the lakes committee support us doing. Um, utilizing grants and cost share programs to assist landowners with funding. Healthy Lake Trans are a great way to do that. Um, and we have uh, some uh, initiatives going forward to help provide funding for homeowners who want to help do that. Um, and then providing native plant communities designed with natural biodegradable roads and control pollution. So, oh, I might have lost the other. Thanks. 
the watershed photo that I'm showing you here is the headwaters of the Flambeau River. Um, you'll see where we are just to get your bearings down there, Highway 51, Mercer Community Center. Town of Winchester, um, the purple center here. Got it. Um, this is outside of your watershed down here is a flowage. Um, these three lakes right here are kind of a primary area that we've done most of our work in. We've got North Turtle there, South Turtle there, and then Rock is just tucked up in here. Um, I'll talk about Harris. This is the one other Winchester Lake that's not in your watershed, but it's got a pretty good example of Pearl Lily Pond, which just because it doesn't drain here doesn't mean it's not an issue because there are boats that go from that lake into other lakes very close to your watershed even within it. Um, but listed over here is also all the lakes that um, we have been out on and how things came in, in Winchester. So to just touch on three areas of water quality in these headwater lakes, <clears throat> Secchi Death, Phosphorus, and Chlorophyll. Um, again, we're short on time today to really tell you everything you want to know about these things, or maybe this is all you want to know for some of you. Um, Secchi Death is a, a measure of clarity. How clear is your water? You're going to drop a disc down, you're going to measure when you can't see it anymore. So they even flip your graph up here for you so that you can think this is the surface of the water and you're looking down deep into the water. So here's your lakes up here. We've got Harris, that's one over the border, but North Turtle, South Turtle, and Rock Lake. Um, this means 8.4, we're in feet. So you can see 8.4 feet deep into the water. That's your water clarity. Um, different types of lakes have different types of characteristics. So we've got down here, they're going to identify what type of lakes each of these are. We've got deep headwater drainage lakes, the shallow lowland drainage lakes, which is rock up in that top headwater lake, and then deep lowland drainage lakes, um, North, North Turtle is as well. Um, these graphs you can also find um, in the Winchester Town Lakes plan if you're more interested in learning more about it. And it's also available on town's website from them. Chlorophyll, um, this broken down into simplest terms is um, the phytoplankton in your water concentration. Chlorophyll is something that um, is used with plants during photosynthesis. Um, what is important to know here is this 20 micrograms per liter, that's what is considered a threshold to have nuisance algal blooms. So the more chlorophyll you have, the more likely you're going to have these algae outbreaks, um, floating after algae and algal blooms throughout your water body. Um, none of the lakes up in the headwaters here showed close to that 20 micrograms per liter. The highest rock lake is 11.8. Um, your average for the area of the, the northern part of the state of Wisconsin is 5.6. So a lot of these are close to that average. Some might be high, but they're still not high enough to be considered um, close to having nuisance algal blooms. Phosphorus is the last of those three things. We did secchi, chlorophyll, phosphorus. Phosphorus basically is related to how much plant growth will grow in your lake in simple terms. Um, it's a primary nutrient controlling the growth of the phyto phytoplankton, which is tiny microalgae. Um, and the majority of Wisconsin lakes. One thing to take into consideration is to think of the proportion of a watershed of a lake, to how much water a lake can hold. If you have a really big watershed and a really tiny shallow lake, it doesn't have a lot of surface area, not a lot of depth, you're gonna end up with a lot of phosphorus going into that. The level of phosphorus is gonna be high in that lake. Good example is Tamarack Lake right here. And that's what this is showing. Harris Lake, that one's the one in the Great Lakes Basin. Um, very small watershed ratio to very big, deep lake. So therefore, the total phosphorus was very low. Um, and you can see that on this graph as well. Harris was the lowest, Tamarack's the highest. So the North Turtle, South Turtle, and Rock are um, you know, averaging here with what the northern region of the state is. So aquatic and nature species in Winchester. Um, Curlily pondweed is one well-known. It's a submerged plant. 
We have been working to visit all the lakes in Winchester to survey them early in the year. Um, it's called the early season AIS survey. And we will try to um, get out on all the bodies of water and use our volunteers for the community to help with this. Uh, none of the populations exist in any of the Turtle Channel lakes in the town of Winchester that we're aware of. Um, Harris Lake is the only one. I love this photo here because you can see this is a turion and you can see these roots, these little rhizomes coming off. And this is just rooted, this brand new turion. It's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven roots coming off of it. When one of those things gets down into that sediment, you get another one. And, and ideally, what probably happens is you have a bunch of turions that land down in the sediment from one or two plants that got the flower the year before. All of those sprout for more and more. When you go to full curly pond, you can't just pull one plant out. They're all connected. Um, this is exactly how it was in the Bay of Rice Lake there um, where we were working. There were very young plants scattered through a lily population. And you have to try and get all of these little rises. Very diligent work um, to do this. But anyways, moving forward, Harris Lake has had a problem in the past. It was first discovered in 2008. We worked with Ontera to do um, mapping and planning for it. Then with um, some companies to do aquatic herbicide treatments, which were done in 2011, 12, and 13. After that, it was so sparse, we moved back to hand pulling, which is where we're at now. Um, there was a spike last year that we found a lot more. So in the late end of the year, we went out and surveyed the lake in August as well to collect that data of how bad the extent was. And going forward, we're mo moving to try and um, use grant funding to help pay for some of this planning and uh, manual removal uh, services again for continuing to control it. Purple loose stripe is another one. Um, this was a great example of how important it is to know what these plants are, know how to identify them, and know what to do. Because we went out, and this is also Winchester Town Lakes Committee, like shining at its brightest. We're just one crew, we have one boat, one man. Um, and to go out on lakes across the county of Violas, through all of Manitou's waters, we work in Boulder Junction work up in Winchester, um, everywhere that we go, and you've got purple blue stripes blooming for like two or three weeks, you know, and maybe it's raining some of these days. You don't even get out there every day. Um, on top of the other things we need to do. So we were able to use volunteers from the community that live on all these lakes, and I know these folks because I'm coming to the table with them once a month. I'm like, hey, ladies, what, what time are you able to do this? And we go out on the boat with them, so we don't have to launch a boat on every single one of these lakes, Hop on with them, they learn about the plants, they learn about our survey methods, what to do, what to look for. Half of them already know this by now. And we've saved our resources and able to expand our efforts while utilizing volunteers. We got out on, there's probably five lakes that we had volunteers help us come onto their boats to do the survey for. But um, Party Lake, one single plant right there on a hillside. This is taken down the shore. It's not right at the water's edge, halfway up their hill. One purple blue stripe plant. That got away and seeded. Next year you have like a hundred. The year after that it's two hundred, and it just goes exponentially out of control. So, this effort and the help of the Turtle Lakes Committee, to, um, sorry, the Town of Winchester Lakes Committee and their efforts and having the relationships we do, prevented an outbreak of purple blue stripe from occurring at Party Lake over the next couple of years because we're looking for it. So. That's a great example. There's a few plants on Lake Adelaide. There were um, a single homeowner there that was notified of the infestation, and he pulled out a whole truckload himself before we got out to survey for it. So homeowners, again, and volunteers doing their part um, to help stop the spread. Spiny water flea is another one that we help with. Um, there were no new spiny water flea detections in Vilas County last year. All the results from this year's data collections aren't necessarily in yet. We sample all the lakes on a rotating basis. Um, so over the course of three years, they get sampled again. Um, there are many lakes in the area, if you read this list of lakes right here. Um, for the state of Wisconsin, spiny water flea, this is a little piece, of, a little tiny zooplankton animal. Um, 
eats native zooplankton like Daphne and stuff, um, throws off the balance of that, uh, you know, ecosystem food chain at that very important small level. But in the state of Wisconsin, maybe someone else here knows how many spiny water flea lakes there are, but there's not many. It's like 10 or 12, maybe. So to have this many lakes in the area in this whole state, it's, it's important to know about it and to be surveying to look for further spread because that says like we're a hot spot of an outbreak in the state. Yellow flag iris. Um, this is one of the largest efforts um, that we did as well uh, on the Rock Lake, North Turtle, and South Turtle. These maps were produced here. You'll see this for Rock Lake that had the highest density of it, likely brought here as a garden cultivar. Our strategy was we went out, surveyed all the plants, we quantified them in a matter of sparse, medium, or dense, sent mailers to the residents. This was in part with the Turtle Lakes Chain Association up there for the North Turtle and North and South Turtle and Rock Lake chain. They got 83% response rate, which is awesome. 100% um, agreed to cooperate with efforts. They either had the options to pull it themselves or we would come pull it. And mailers went out again this year. We're continuing to pull it. Um, and there's some statistics for how far we've made it in 2020. There were, between 2019 to 2022, we're seeing an increase of populations mapped. Part of that's probably finding new ones, not necessarily that spreading that rapidly. Um, some of it's from spread. In 2022 here, you can see we pulled an estimated 1,600 pounds um, out of the shoreline. One of the strategies that's important is starting with these outliers and um, your small sparse populations because those are where you're going to get worse faster and then clipping the heads for the flowers on the more dense areas where it's entire shorelines because those are going to need a restoration plan to be implemented with it and some solutions for other plants and soils and erosion control materials to put back in place. So as we're finishing all these sparse populations this year, We'll be mapping what came up and what didn't next year, and then moving forward with restoring some of these larger areas um, as we use things like healthy lake strands to help pay for some of the funding for the native plants and things um, during that process. This is the plan where you can find all of those awesome graphs I showed you if you're interested in more. We've been a part of the lake planning um, for the town of Winchester, which contains a lot of these headwater lakes. Um, this was issued in 2020. But the first round of those point intercept uh, surveys, which are part of this plan, those are conducted in 2015. So the first lakes are up for renew. The DNR likes to see those every five or six years um, to be resurveyed. So we've applied for grants for 2023 for these two lakes, Harris and Hiawatha. Um, and the town of Winchester is supporting that and helping um, move forward with renewing all of these lakes as we go through a new phase every year um, to keep the plan up to date. Healthy Lakes Grant, and this is a DNR funding grant, and maybe your Iron County might participate too, but us as the Discovery Center is participating, and homeowners should know about this and talk to either myself or your land and water folks. Um, these are all the different options that are offered and it's funding available to homeowners um, with a pretty small match up to $1,000, 25% match, 25% um, match on that. And then these practices can pay for a lot of the shoreline practices that are gonna help keep your lakes clean and healthy. Lake associations that are established could also apply for these grants. And it's per individual property or practice um, that's being implemented. So for example, if there was a flowage lake association or a turtle chain or turtle river lake association, I guess turtle river association for the area, then they would be um, eligible to possibly receive their own grants to facilitate projects and restoration um, efforts like that. Um, <coughs> so that is, the end of it, and we'll hold our questions to the end. Um, I think I made it. Stop there. <laughs> Thanks, Jamie. There's uh, cookies and.
brownies <coughs> and it looks like lemon bars and coffee. Please help yourself, uh, provided by the Rice Lake Association. And uh, we'll turn it over to Zach Wilson from the Iron County Land Water Conservation. I'm going to change it up and stand on this side. <laughs> uh, I, I have yeah. to say, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Oh, sorry. Camera, so don't stand with your back to it. I need to be on this side. I've got a bunch of people on All right, I'll come over. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I, I have to say, uh, first of all, thank you and welcome. Uh, look around the room. I, I looked around the room and I can't tell you how excited I am that you all are here. Many of which have worked with you on an individual basis or as a lake association. I see Camille Kish, a former student at Mercer in the audience. Yes, I pointed her out. Heather and I uh, at the Iron County Land and Water Conservation Department, Heather Palmquist, we started at the North Lake Bay Discovery Center. We started that waters program. I won't tell you how long ago, but how excited I am to see that grow and to see all of you here. This is a real win. And we, we use education in this field of conservation a lot. And to see you here and, and grow and get active is a huge win for me. And I'm excited because uh, five or in 2015, when I first started with the Iron County Land and Water Conservation Department, I didn't have a crowd like this. Invasive species, water quality monitoring is here and you're excited about it and we're growing it. That's a win for education. So thank you. Mike gave me the huge challenge of doing all this in 30 minutes. If you know me, that's a real problem. <laughs> so I, I focused a little bit. Um, and I'm going to talk about the Turtle River and the Turtle Flambeau Floyd watershed. And that is another big win. We're not zoomed in on our lake. We're talking about what really matters and, and looking at things on a watershed level. Because like Mike said, what happens upstream is affected downstream. I'm gonna talk about our Citizen Lake Monitoring uh, Network program and the data that we've collected here in Iron County. So Jamie got a real good uh, kind of background and now I'm gonna zoom in a little bit down the Turtle River and share with you our findings. Uh, I did have to focus, so not all of the lakes are in. If you want that information, I'm happy to provide it. Um, and then I'm going to uh, talk about um, invasive species within that watershed. And again, I'm focused in on the watershed. Why not click it? We should have a problem. Okay, try again. There's a green one. All right, first of all, the Iron County Land and Conservation Department. Every county in the state of Wisconsin has one of these. We're really fortunate in the north here that um, we don't have a lot of agriculture and a lot of our work is focused on water quality, invasive species, shoreline restorations, uh, a whole variety of different projects. So um, we're really focused on some of those water resources. We are a super small staff, Heather Palmquist and myself. <laughs> and if just imagine the amount of work that I'm going to share with you um, and things that Jamie had shared, there's a lot to do. And we need you to help us do those things. Um, Heather and I do an immense amount of work. We have our native plant sale in the spring and early summer. Uh, Heather works on nutrient management planning. I do invasive species citizen uh, lake monitoring projects. We have a wildlife damage and abatement program, and we do a ton of conservation education. Um, we're also an office that's not just sitting in the office. They're not, these, the work is not confined to these walls. We're out actively doing. We're planting, helping landowners restore their shorelines, looking and monitoring for invasive species, removing invasive species, helping collect water quality, we do a whole variety of different projects. Um, just to name a few, involved in the Clean Boats, Clean Waters uh, Boat Inspection Program on the Turtle Flammable Foliage and Dial Foliage. Help uh, coordinate the Citizen Lake Monitoring 
invasive species and water quality monitoring program. In 2022, 35 lake sites participated. Um, actively physically removing curly leaf pondweed and monitoring, watching the spread, helping plan for management. Shoreline habitat surveys. Uh, Zach Lawson will be sharing that information. Really exciting partnerships with the DNR and fisheries related to our lakes. Uh, water quality sampling. Uh, specific funding that focuses on the turtle climate flows for uh, aquatic invasive species. Sampling uh, the dial flowage, watching the trends of the spiny water flea throughout the year. AIS monitoring for spiny water fleas and zebra mussels. Good news, uh, zero, no new detections for spiny water flea and zebra mussels for Iron County this year. Shoreline restor restorations and mitigation projects we do. Shoreline water diversion practices, conservation education, and terrestrial invasive species monitoring and control. Two staff. <laughs> um, I wanted to also talk about how, what is a watershed? Some of you might not know what a watershed is. So I wanted to just define that a little bit. And I like the diagram on the left where it's a funnel. Think about it as a funnel. Drainage basins, watershed, the land drained by a river or stream and all of its tributaries, also known as a drainage basin. So when I share some of this stuff, think about flow and movement down the, the basin. It is actually, the Turtle River is here, but this is actually the Turtle Flyable Flowage Watershed. It's bigger than just the Turtle River. Um, in this presentation, due to time, I'm going to focus on the Turtle River. But we have many watersheds throughout our county. So if you don't fall in this particular area, think about partnering up, think about looking at a watershed basis. Um, and I, I want to start off with um, our water quality monitoring program. Uh, I had mentioned 35 sites uh, were monitored in Iron County in 2022. And I think it's important to tell our volunteers or to share the, the data that they collected. Because you're out there, we're asking you to go out there uh, to collect this information, but you want to know what it is. So here are some of our locations. In the, in the watershed, all the arrows represent in uh, 2022, water quality that has been sampled or data collected. The orange arrows are uh, sites that have water chemistry taken, which is a, an additional uh, survey and, and water collecting uh, protocol that has happened where that information gets shipped to the state lab of hygiene and it's analyzed for its phosphorus and chlorophyll amounts, as Jamie had also mentioned. And these are the lakes that were part of that program. <coughs> um, water chemistry, as I mentioned, it, it changes a little bit in Iron County, that particular program, in that there are some sites that are long-term trend data sites. So DNR is funding this for the long-term. And then DNR also has a program uh, with the water chemistry where they fund a three-year snapshot of your lake. And so for three years, if you sign up and get trained, we'll get a baseline data set for that particular lake. And then due to funding, they have to move around and hop around the, the state uh, to look at various other lakes. There are also uh, many volunteers that just do water clarity and temperature profiles. Again, looking at that clarity in the water column. Um, this is all run through a big state program. We have to thank the DNR and the funds that provide us to help us in this county because it, there's competition. I am a huge advocate for us and I'm constantly fighting for long-term uh, funding for data collecting for us because I think it's valuable. I'm also constantly fighting for new lakes to be added to our list. Um, and we work with this wonderful lady named Sandy Wickman and we're part of her regional coordinators area. 
So Sandy trains us, provides the equipment, and then I help at the local level. All of this information is entered into a state database called the Surface Water Integrated Monitoring System, or SWIMS. You can access that data by just simply Googling your lake name and then hitting more and then going to the water quality uh, page and learn about what data has been collected. So if you want more information, Google search your lake, find out. And again, why do we do this? We want baseline data to monitor change. We can learn about resolved oxygen levels, fish kills, spring uh, or, or algae blooms in the fall, accelerated plant growth. But again, learning that baseline data is really important to monitor change over time. And it also gives us this thing we call the tropic classification. And I can't share this information with you without explaining the different types of classification. And so uh, real simple, the oligotrophic, is a lake basically real clear water clarity, not a lot of nutrients, not a lot of plant growth. Um, lake Superior is a classic oligotrophic lake, bold, clear. You end up getting species like trout, that kind of thing. Um, usually lots of dissolved oxygen all the way through the column. The next one, the mesotrophic uh, lake, you start to see aquatic plants growing up. You get a little more nutrients in there, uh, you can, during the summer, have low oxygen levels uh, towards the bottom of the lake, and you may experience some algae blooms. And then the eutrophic is the, the oldest part of the lake uh, where you get lots of nutrients in there, lots of plant growth, warmer water, more water, uh, warm water species of fish, um, and then you have lower levels of oxygen and algae blooms. So uh, important to know those oligotrophic, mesotrophic, and eutrophic. Remember, because I'm going to quiz you. <laughs> that process from oligotrophic to eutrophic is supposed to take centuries, a long time of aging a lake. And so having that baseline information is so important because if we're starting to see something speed up and it's changing in decades instead of centuries, we now need to look for a problem. And in watersheds, it could be the top, it could be localized. Um, we, it, it, it's a good baseline data. So remember that. The other thing is when we collect this data, there's some numbers I want you to, here's the quiz part as well. Um, our Secchi disk reading, that water clarity is compared often to the Northwest geo region. And our average georegion is a nine foot water clarity. Remember, though, you live in Iron County. <laughs> Just hold on to that number. Um, the chlorophyll numbers for our Northwest georegion, the average for the summer, and that, that data is collected two weeks after ice out, June, July, and August. Our average for the georegion is 15.7 milligrams per liter. The phosphorus number uh, is a number, here's the scale here, where the higher you get, the more eutrophic you get. So uh, lakes that have more than 20 and impoundments that have more than 30 of total phosphorus may experience noticeable algae bloom. All right, recap, 15.7, lakes more than 20. Remember those numbers. So let's take a quick dive in. The top for Iron County, Cedar Lake. Here's the Turtle River coming in, going out. In 2022, and you always got a question the data. How many samples were taken? We, this is really important. I actually looked this up in the database and the lab has not put two samples into this formula yet. So, for Cedar Lake, the summer average was 21.2 milligrams per liter. Quiz, what's the average or what, what happens? What number where you start to notice? 20. 20. Good. 
And then the chlorophyll, 12.7. What's the number? 15.7, all right? And then our water clarity for Cedar Lake is 6.85 as a means, not nine, which is the Northwest June region average. So with that information combined, the, the data spits out this lake classification and it puts it at a eutrophic lake. So kind of that further, where we kind of want to go uh, away from, but understand lakes have been formed for a long time. Each one of them is different. They have different aspects of it. So, and also I, I should warn you that don't stick to this too much because it varies from year to year based on the information. We could have rain events, we could have warm events, cold events, it could change. Let's go down river, Catherine Lake. Now this is interesting because Catherine Lake is just a Secchi disc of sample lake. And, and thanks to Brenda and her husband for helping collect some of this information. Um, this put it at a mesotrophic lake just solely based on the clarity of Catherine Lake, which is 6.75. And it was sampled four times last year. So a slightly better classification. Let's go down the river to Fisher Lake. Now, Fisher Lake is one of these lakes that we've collected data on for a long time. And it's a chemistry collected lake. So that sample is being sent to the lab. <coughs> Fisher Lake has a chlorophyll average of 7.7. .7. What's the georegion average? 15.7, <coughs> quite a bit low. And a total phosphorus of 18.3. So below that 20 threshold, looking good. Throws it as a, a mesotrophic lake. With a water or a Secchi uh, reading of 8.5 in 2022. So it's clearer than the other lakes. Hopping over, still in the watershed, the Long Lake, another lake that we collect chemistry. Um, we had in 2022, uh, Long Lake actually got sampled quite a few times. Uh, it's part of a special study lake of the Directed Lakes projects. And so we got pretty good information out of it. And Long Lake had a chlorophyll of 10.6 and a phosphorus of 18.8 with a Secchi disc reading of 4.75. Really dark stained water coming out of the bog area of northern part of our lake. And it says mostly impacted by tan and stain from decaying matter. So well, as we go through this, we need to learn the lake's kind of chemistry and, and uh, makeup. Spider Lake, Jim Bransell, he's not in the room, is he? What a volunteer. He's been doing this for a long time, since 1998, a stellar volunteer. He's on top of it. Um, Spider Lake turns out to be a mesotrophic lake, chlorophyll real low, 2.7, um, with a, uh, where's my phosphorus? Oh, this was something that the lab must not have had uh, pop up. The phosphorus was not um, identified in this particular sample. But when we think about looking at a lake on a one-year basis versus a couple decades, we can then look at trends which we love in the science world. And interesting enough, if you look from 1998 to uh, 2022, we have a declining trend of water clarity for Spider Lake. I'm not gonna read into it, why? It's just, this is the data. Echo, uh, there's two locations on Echo Lake. This year it's a water chemistry a sample. In the, just the May sample, 18.1 and 5.63 um, for chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is an indication of algae growth. Now, I look at this and I say, what kind of algae growth is happening in May? Not much. So understand that as well. Throws it as a mesotrophic lake. Rice lake. Now we had some changing of the, of the guards in our volunteers, which typically happens. So, uh, Rice Lake, uh, we only had one sample and I collected it 
uh, this year, and we have a new set of volunteers coming up, but they've done it for a long time. We have some good information, so I stole the 21 data. Rice Lakes water clarity uh, for 21 was 4.88 feet. The phosphorus was 21.3, so slightly above the 20, and then the chlorophyll level of 11. Interesting enough, the one sample I took of the water clarity this year put it at 8.5 feet. So when I was out there, it was super clear. I don't know why, but that's a point of interest. Now we're going down the river. Pike Lake is the big dumping. It's a little larger lake. Uh, we did it for three years. We had very low chlorophyll samples, 1.8, and phosphorus of 13.3. Throws it as an oligotrophic lake with a water clarity of 8.75. So you can't just stick with the reading of Cedar Lake as you go down because each lake is different. Um, really important stuff though. So in a way you could say the water coming through Pike Lake is cleaner than when it started. <laughs> Interesting. That's interpreting. You'll be careful. Uh, all the way down the chain now to Lake of the Falls. And here we have a mesotrophic. Lake of the Falls is a different lake. There's a lot of plants growing in it. It's the dumping of all of what's up above with the phosphorus of 18.5 with chlorophyll of 4.5. Water clarity. 5.65. So now you dark, darkened again. Um, and then at the very end, we have the turtle primal flowage. Uh, we have six sites that we sample on the turtle primal flowage. It's a large body of water. Um, but this is the inlet. So as the turtle dumps in, and we have a, a water clarity of 5.75, a chlorophyll of 7.9, and a phosphorus of 17.4. The turtle climb of foliage is an impoundment. So that's a different kind of uh, number that we look at. Impoundments with 30 or more could experience more algae growth. So thanks to Diana Cronley yesterday, or she took this picture at the outlet. Things look pretty good as you get into the turtle climb of foliage. But I say that don't stop our monitoring or our need or our want to keep monitoring because if you go to the other end of the flowage to the town line lake area chlorophyll 11.2 and the phosphorus of 35. so i probably confused you more than i clarified things but understand that things are different and they change but in general we're looking pretty good with our water quality report so I'm going to switch to uh, invasive species now. And I know a lot of us are here, uh, are interested in all of the activity that's happened with our permanent economy projects. And I got to tell you, I'm super excited about it because you are all aware now, or more aware than you were probably five years ago. When Heather and I were doing presentations, talking about the threat of invasive species here, and we only got five people to attend our talks. We're all listening now, which is exciting uh, in good and a bad way. Um, so uh, it's complicated though. We have at the Iron County Land and Water Department, we deal with a lot of invasive species, not just one. And so I have to prioritize my workload based on phenology, the, when certain plants bloom, when they go to seed, what's best management practices, and so here's a list of water bodies in our county, 27 water bodies with AIS. That's awesome, actually. Uh, we have 494 lakes. We're looking good. We don't want it to spread. We don't want these numbers to grow. And so education and awareness is everything. Cedar Lake, Rusty Crayfish up at the top. Grand Portage, I'm sorry, uh, Fisher, um, has the banded and the Chinese mystery snow. This invasive is spreading all over and you really don't do much about it. 
it's difficult. I think it's being spread by waterfowl. It's, it's a whole nother thing. And it's not one that we are, as a state, at doing much about. Uh, it's hard to deal with. Um, the ones in red are in the watershed. Uh, I'm sorry, the ones in red are ones that I'm worried about, an invasive species that concerns me. So Grand Portage, yellow iris, a real bad problem of yellow iris, um, similar to what Jamie had showed with the, the Winchester, the Turtle Lakes, educating the public, going out and removing these, really important. Um, Long Lake, Long Lake has Eurasian water milfoil, first detected in 2006. And Long, uh, that milfoil has now spread all throughout the entire lake and starting to, to come down the river. Eurasian water milfoil is one of these plant species similar to curly pondweed. It's very, very difficult to manage once you get it. The word eradication is never used. It's management and adapting. Uh, Long Lake Creek, Mercer Lake has yellow iris. Pike Lake has now curly pondweed and yellow iris. Rice, curly pondweed, spider, purple loosestrife, turtle flammable foliage, purple loosestrife, and aquatic forget-me-nots. And the Turtle River has curly pondweed, purple loosestrife, and yellow iris, to name a few. If you map them out, here they are as they come down the river. And this is a heat map showing the intensity of abundance on, on some of these. This should also be real hot right here at Long Lake. I have not monitored the milfoil. It's everywhere else. Um, so uh, thinking about those things, what are we doing in the department? Well, we're educating the public, we're identifying them, and we're removing. And I like this new program we have. We hire three to four staff every year as LTEs, limited term employees, and we train these folks. They're very good and we're physically out there removing and working with landowners. Very important. This photo is on Long Lake. Um, chemical uh, application can be used, but a permit is needed if it's in the uh, under the ordinary high water mark in the water. This is over by Stone Lake and Springstead. Um, if left alone, this yellow iris can ring an entire lake. 70% of McDermott Lake's shoreline is yellow iris. So it's something that we haven't dealt with for a long time. It needs to be on our radar. We can do it. The other one is purple loose stripe. Um, this has been uh, a project to our department in partnership with the DNR and other lake associations for a very long time. And I feel like we're gaining some ground. This is on the turtle flambo foliage. You can see all the purple heads in the back. Um, my staff, they're awesome. We train them in, we work them hard before and after. <laughs> they're still smiling. Uh, we really have done a, a great job. We've stopped using herbicides. And we're, we're pulling these out physically, we're bagging them and throwing them in dumpsters, and I think it's helping. Uh, we have a great mapping program, a partnership with the Turtle Flamble Flowage True Lake Association, Randy Payne. We share our data and he maps it out, and we can monitor trends over time. And these are all the locations that we've uh, identified since 2016 on the turtle farm floor. One of our, our spotlight programs, like Jamie had also mentioned with Winchester, the volunteers of the association get assigned an area and they go to that area and monitor it for handful. And so we've got a task force of, of weed warriors out there pulling and learning and actively <clears throat> doing things. There's this wonderful crew of one, one day uh, a year, because 95% of the flowage is state owned, um, we get this great crew together where we have fisheries and wildlife managers and the flowage property owners and the association and county staff. And we go and hammer on, and it really seems to be working well. The other program 
Uh, with purple loosestrife, that we do is this uh, biocontrol, Gaviacella beetle, and it actually targets just purple loosestrife. It works great in certain situations, and it's another tool that we have in the toolbox. Another plant on my radar, and it should be on others, is the European marsh thistle. It's a very aggressive uh, thistle, an invasive plant. It loves wetland areas, roadside ditches, and my locations are Highway G north of Long Lake, uh, Highway 51 on Pine Lake, and then over Papua Circle by Lake of the Falls Campground. The thistle seeds develop and float really light like a dandelion to the the air and it can spread big time. It's awful in the eastern part of the US. This is a kind of a unique species that it's moving east to west. And the UP is real bad. Garlic mustard, another terrestrial invasive that I just want you to be aware of because if you live up by Fisher Lake or over by Springstead, the Montreal River, there it's real bad and it's spreading and I need your help. Another plant uh, to be aware of is wild parsnip. Uh, I actually feel like we have this plant really under control. And this is a nasty roadside plant, loves river systems uh, down in Southern Wisconsin, it's everywhere. And when you get the plant juices on your arm, this is our, our highway department guy, burned his arm very bad, like a bad burn. So it's something not to mess around with. Uh, I'm almost to the curly pond weed. Eurasian water milfoil, as I mentioned, is spreading down. We need to keep monitoring that plant. It takes one little fragment for it to be transported to another water body and spread. Here we are, the infamous curly leaf pond weed. And you know, the nice thing about today, and that we heard from Jamie, is that we're not alone, are we, here in Iron County? We need to pool our resources, share our information, and talk about strategies for management, because it's all over the state. It's not just Rice Lake, Turtle River, and uh, Pike. It has a nasty way of reproducing, which maybe you think is awesome. It's really a freak of nature. It has that turion that grows, as Jimmy had mentioned. Also, it can spread through fragmentation. If you ran a motorboat through it, it grows from one foot to 15 foot in, in the water column. It mats up. It has this crazy uh, phenology that it grows when other plants, other native plants are not growing. And this is a, a classic kind of timeline that is out of a textbook. Uh, that we used to, to really look at as a guide for management. And from my experiences with dealing with this plant, I've added a whole new thing. <laughs> because it's not following the rules. It's growing under the ice. It's growing right now. Um, it has an incredible uh, way of reproducing. Those rhizomes, when they're cut, they spread and produce more. Uh, it's just very, very difficult to deal with. And our hand pulling efforts are showing some success, but it's huge amount of physical labor and manpower, human power. To go through this timeline, it's intense. We've been dealing with this project for a very long time, but it was first detected in Rice Lake in 2013 by no other than the infamous Diane O'Cromley. <laughs> who was a science teacher in Hurley that was part of our program as an education program that learned how to identify it. And when she was with the loony paddlers going down the river, she saw it. Education is power. <clears throat> Hand pulling efforts started for a few years. Noticeable spread in 2016. 2019, I found it downstream at Ruggers Landing. And then my staff went upstream and found it at 83 sites on the turtle lake. So it spread downstream quickly. 2020, Rice Lake Association, Bob Carey, uh, president, we presented to the, to the Pike Lake Friends Group, who was not an association. 
and they got scared they got organized. They got a grant for $20,000 from the DNR to monitor, organize. They're doing awesome. Um, we've gathered volunteers every year after that and hand pulled on tur from the Turtle River and Pike Lake. Bob Carey and the Rice Lake folks have gotten a grant for $127,000 for three years to do massive amounts of polling. Makes a huge effort. Um, over time, I've noticed slight reductions of populations. In 21, we had 70 sites on the Turtle River. In 22, we had 60 sites. But we're putting in over 300 hours of time removing with multiple different people. We contracted with the Discovery Center and Jamie's crew to help us pull on the South Bay of Rice Lake, which had not been part of their lake, their grant, their 127,000. So they're working here. Pike Lake has all of this. And so Jamie helped us down here in the South Bay because this plant is all the way down. Um, what we've learned, the lessons we've learned, and I think I got a photo here, yep. It, it's spreading downstream um, Pike Lake through that $20,000 grant, hired a consultant to help do point intercept surveys, plant surveys, and they identified four other locations on Pike Lake in 2021 and 22. And then this year, Cindy Moriarty, wonderful volunteer, kayaking up from Lake of the Falls to help us pull, identified it in three other places on the Turtle River on its way to Lake of the Falls. So this plant is aggressive. Lessons learned. This guy right here, Steve Anderson in the back of the room, Dwayne, I see Dwayne there. They are champions of our lake group. They've organized, they've got a great website, they're getting volunteers together, bringing them up from Lake of the Falls, obviously they're concerned, and we're, we're religiously hand pulling these locations. And they're small locations. They're maybe 20 by 20 feet. But Steve goes back every week on Pike Lake and finds new plant growth. It's one that you just can't quite get rid of. We had, I'll go back one, my first location here at um, Rubber's Landing was 2019. We pulled the heck out of it. It disappeared for two years. It showed up this year. I don't know if that was a regrowth from the Turion base, which can last up to seven years, or was it new Turions coming downstream? But a very difficult task. And, and the lessons that we've learned is persistence. Persistent monitoring. The other big lesson to take home is that we need to maintain and keep our native ecosystem healthy and strong. So they're potentially the best tool we have to fight back this species. Almost done. Education is important. My staff goes to the Turtle Climate Flowage, the Guile, and Saxon Harbor and educates the public as they come and go from our water bodies, our busiest boat landings. They contacted 771 people and inspected 383 boats last, or this year. Very impressive, important project. I could go on and on and on, but you can see we've done a lot and I'm proud that you're here. Um, we're gonna talk more. Um, in the panel discussions, but please get a hold of us if you have more questions. Get involved, join like minded groups, become a citizen lake monitoring, help all of these hand pulling efforts, um, especially if you live in this water system. And um, know your native plants and your invasive plants. It will, it will be kind of a cool uh, study for you. Get the youth involved, that we're all aging and we need our young people to come in here to take over. And so 
teach a grandkid or a kid or the neighbor boy or girl, really get the youth involved. Um, I have a, a shameless plug in here. I want to collect more data. I want to do more fun things with you. And we, this is an area that we're really lacking in is our ice on and off data. I have a program to help you uh, help us monitor that as well. And thank you. Did I actually stay in like 30 minutes? No, uh, not even close. <laughs> Sorry. So uh, when you came in, there was a sheet with the four speakers' uh, names, their email addresses, and their organizations. And there were also um, uh, kind of a question, you know, questions that you might have uh, when Zach Dawson was in it, and also ideas for what the next program might be. So uh, grab a sheet and, and make some notes before you leave. And uh, and then the only other takeaway that I that I wanted to reiterate was if you're moving your boat or your neighbor is moving his or her boat from lake to lake, make sure you um, talk to them about uh, what it takes to clean boats and let let them, you know disinfect them and let them dry out. Especially you saw a list of the affected lakes. Especially if your neighbor is going to a, an affected lake. I want to turn it over to Zach Lawson, the fisheries biologist from Wisconsin DNR. Thanks, Mike. Um, well, I think uh, Zach Wilson talked just long enough that I think he covered half the material. I'm trying to cut things up a little bit here, but um, no, I'm going to talk about the fisheries of the Turtle River Lake family. Um, and a lot of that is going to involve, involve around uh, not only talking about the overall fish community that kind of goes up and down throughout the river system, but a lot of this is going to revolve around the habitats that are provided by each different lake along the way and kind of how they work together. So I want to provide different uh, fisheries, really, different angling opportunities, um, and and uh, how different different uh, uh, issues impact all of them similar. So um, <clears throat> more specifically, I'm going to first talk about a few terms and concepts to make sure that we're on the same page, hopefully help you understand what I'm talking about. Um, and then I'll talk about some broad scale similarities among the lakes, um, and then some more minor differences uh, between them. Um, and then get into more drivers of change in, in how we try to influence fisheries and, and how we're kind of up against some of these larger uh, drivers uh, that can change the fisheries um, much faster and in a much larger capacity than we can. Uh, and then finally, we'll touch on some opportunities for action going forward. Um, okay, so first of all, I want to note here that as I talk about fisheries and the different habitats that are available throughout these systems, um, one, I'm going to bring up the riparian zone, okay, um, and I'm talking about high and dry, everything on land that's near the water, okay. Um, if you live on a lake, that's kind of your, your backyard. Uh, I'm also going to talk about the littoral zone, and that is specifically talking about the area that sunlight can touch the bottom or the benthos of the lake, okay? Um, and I'll talk about these two together, the riparian zone and the littoral zone, together is kind of the near shore area. There's a lot going on there, so it's a really, uh, it's right where the rubber meets the road, so there's a lot going on, um, and, and, and I'll kind of lump them together in the near shore area. And then finally, the, the pelagic zone, everybody kind of glosses over this habitat, but in actuality, for a lot of our species, this is a really, really key component for some of the uh, life stages and for some of our unique uh, fish species that we have in the Turtle River system. Um, and that would be what you would consider kind of most people think that the abyss, the open water, kind of really out there. Well, that open water zone, uh, I'll refer to as the pelagic zone, um, and keep that in mind as, as we go forward. Um, now, before we talk about fisheries or any fish species in particular, it's important to remember that the fish are really, they're, they're, they're an animal. They're, they're very basic in nature. They only need a few things, right? Uh, they all need ample oxygen. They all need a temperature within their preferred range. Um, they need a place to eat. They need food. They need a place to hide. It's a fishy fish world out there. Um, and then finally, they need a place to spawn. So think about these things. Think about how they might differ from species to species to species. Um, as such, the, the fish in our community, our fish community or the fisheries on the Turtle River system, none of these species are the same. And they've all adapted to different habitats 
and fill different niches um, and, and exploit those various habitats uh, differently. Okay, so that's that's key to remember because when I try to explain this stuff to my mom, she always just says, well, why don't you just stock more? And the answer is kind of like, well, you know, uh, what, what's good for species A is not necessarily good for species B. Um, and maybe species A can live there and species B can't. So keep that in mind too. Um, so to dive in a little bit more about the uh, into those zones, if you will, and talk about the, the habitats that are available within each one, um, as they're really important for structuring the overall uh, or the structure of the fisheries itself. First of all, talking about that open water habitat, this is really, really critical. I was going to talk more about this, but Zach mentioned uh, kind of this, um, this open water area and, and the problem with eutrophication. And then what I want to point out here, uh, specifically with these ciscos, which are a deep water forage fish, but also very important for our open water uh, prey, prey fish like perch and also open water phases of walleyes. Um, this open water habitat is critical and it's critical that it's cool or cold and well oxygenated. Okay. And so we, we refer to this as oxythermal habitat. Um, and what happens is the water stratifies itself, right? You might experience this when you're out swimming in a lake, uh, you're swimming in a nice warm bath water, and you dive down and get cold water. And that is that's thermal stratification at its finest. When you touch that cold water, that would be the beginning of the thermocline. Um, and, and we'll talk more about this, but we need that thermocline to be cold, which you can feel, which is great, but we also need it to be well oxygenated. And so some of the threats that Zach had mentioned, I'll talk more about going forward here, that if that layer is not well oxygenated, then that spells trouble for a lot of our cold water species like Cisco, and our cold water species in open light phases like perch and walleyes. <clears throat> um, next up is substrate. Um, so in that littoral zone, we find a lot of really important substrates, which primarily fall into a couple different categories, silt, sand, rock, and cobble. Um, and of course, bedrock in this area is another one. But um, in any event, these substrates can provide food uh, by, by supporting a lot of a diversity of different vertebrates, but then also provides a spawning substrate for a lot of our fishes. Um, and we'll talk more about that going forward, but keep that in mind because that's really important. And then finally, it provides a substrate or an anchoring point for vegetation. Okay, so, so when we think about um, the type of plants can only live, um, you know, Plants can't live in bedrock, for example. So um, it requires a certain certain type of, of substrate with a certain amount of light. And, and vegetation is our primary source of refuge um, in, in our lakes here. Okay, and that varies where you go regionally or even around the globe. But here we see vegetation is a really, really, really important place for fish this big uh, to make a living. So they don't get eaten by fish this big. Um, and <clears throat> what you'll notice is that when um, when vegetation is in really, really low abundance, uh, we tend to see the scales tip towards predators, right? There's not a lot of refuge. So if you're this big, you're going to get gobbled up. Um, whereas if you see a system with a lot of vegetation, then you see the scales tip the other way, where there's, you know, it's really easy to survive. It's really easy to hard, or really easy to, uh, to evade predation. And it's really hard for predators to come get you. So keep that in mind. And then finally, we have this other habitat, course, we habitat. Um, talk more about, but kind of provides this optimal foraging for predators, um, breaks up the vegetation a little bit, um, and provides a gradient from the treetops down to the base of the log, a really good foraging site for, for predators. So, um, and again, it also provides uh, direct food source for invertebrates and stuff uh, that are, that are uh, living on or inside of that uh, in wood. Um, so to speak about a few, I'm going to kind of switch gears here. And talk about some broad brushstroke similarities among the lakes along the Turtle River system. Um, one is, <clears throat> first and foremost, is that it's primarily a forested watch. Okay, that's fantastic. That's great. Uh, we don't have to deal with a lot of agriculture. We don't have to deal with a lot of industry, um, a lot of point source pollution, things like that. Just fantastic. Uh, but we, we find that a commonality among a lot, a lot of our lakes. Um, as such, in that forested watershed, we see. Uh, we have an awful lot of wetland um, a lot, a lot, not impacts. We see a lot of wetland influence on, on our water. And as Zach, Zach was uh, talking about some water clarity differences uh, in secchi depths among different lakes, um, 
that's all fine and done, dandy. And there's a little bit of fluctuation among the lakes as you go downstream. Some are clearer than others. At the end of the day, it's still Iron County. It's still Teeter Poppy water. Okay, so we have really dark water primarily due to uh, the wetland influence and that organic matter is dissolved organic carbon that flushes out into our lakes. We have dark water and very limited, um, very limited range for light to penetrate through the water column. Um, <clears throat> talk more about that in a second. Um, finally, the, the, the river connection. These lakes all share uh, the river, the Turtle River, as, as a real lifeblood of a lot of these fish communities. So we see that happen in a couple of different ways. We see, as, as, as we heard about earlier, uh, the, river, the river served as um, a large thoroughfare for loggers, people moving from point A to point B. Well, it's no different for fish. Fish have tails in the view. They go upstream, they go downstream. And this river serves as a corridor um, for one, for fish to be able to seek different habitats at different times of the year. So you'll notice in some lakes that are really might not have correct spawning, let's just use, let's use walleyes, for example. Um, uh, in, in say Oxbow Lake, there might not be very much towel or rock habitat for walleyes to spawn on. They can boogie upstream and they can get in the river where they can find the right uh, habitat to, to spawn on and then sink back down into that lake base um, to, to weather out the rest of the year. That said, we also see the river serving as a, a corridor for migration. Uh, we see a lot of spillover. And we see this as, as longer I work in, in this area, I see when lakes are doing really, really well, you'll start to see spillover and emigration from that population into other, other systems downstream and upstream. As there's a surplus in one lake, that river allows that species to push that spillover um, into other systems, adjacent systems. And it uses the river to do that. Um, so some of these lakes can serve as a source population for popular, for, for certain species that do really, really well. Um, and it also serves as, as sink populations, um, as some of those uh, maybe upstream, you know, for example, when Cedar Lake has a bunker here class of walleyes, a lot of those uh, go to the sink population down in Fisher Lake or even Catherine um, and, and grow up and kind of uh, revitalize that, that population downstream. Um, and finally, that river connection allows for a really, really consistent fish community structure throughout the lakes. And as Mike had mentioned earlier, uh, when he asked me about, about the, the fisheries along the Turtle River, yeah, they're all, they're all very, very similar. Um, and they all kind of look like this. These are the major players, uh, save for a few down the flambeau foliage, which I won't touch on in much detail here. Um, but this is, the, this is the overall structure. You see a, a top the apex predator here, the muskie, followed by secondary predators, uh, panfish populations, and then more of your rough fish or, or forage populations, if you will. I'm gonna kind of breeze through these real quickly and then talk about specific fisheries and lakes here in a little bit, but just so that everybody uh, is on the same page with me. Um, the muskies are the apex predator, big toothy critter. They'll eat everything and the rest of the food chain. Um, <clears throat> very similar to the congener, the, the, the northern pike. Um, although the northern pike uh, does a little bit better in, in highly vegetated systems, um, they have sticky eggs, so they, they do a really good job of, of surviving in low oxygen environments and very, very, very highly vegetated areas. Um, Largemouth bass also do very well in, in uh, largely vegetated areas and can make a go of it in silt or, or sand or rock. Um, and you see these as kind of being more habitat generalists here, okay? Um, whereas with these other predators here, you tend to see these as being uh, more habitat specialists. And walleye specifically uh, is real finicky. Um, you might've heard about a lot of regional walleye problems that we're having, and that's because they're just really picky, uh, really picky species. And they, they're, they're very needy. Um, they need just the right cobble and rock habitat to be able to survive. They need just the right open water habitat uh, to be able to have their fry disperse out in open water basin, uh, survive just at the right time of year, depending on just the right hatch just before that of, of yellow perch, um, and just the right Daphnia bloom just before that. And so you see, these 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 are 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 much um, much more finicky in, in, in the Turtle River system. We'll leave it at that for now. And small malt are not very different. Uh, they actually are much more finicky than you might expect, requiring a lot of rock and, and firm bottom. Um, steeper breaks, cooler water to survive, and they're kind of the, uh, the, the large market. Um, 
<clears throat> and we tend to see then, um, similar to some of these, we'll, we'll talk about lake, uh, specific fisheries in a second. Uh, we tend to see all these panfish in all the lakes, uh, but in lakes with more wood and more complex woody habitat, we see a lot more um, a lot more crappies and a lot of interaction between crappies um, and walleyes. A negative interaction that is. Uh, and when we when we move into more silt and sand, we see a lot more uh, bluegills and pumpkin seeds. Um, and in the rocky habitat or open water basin lakes, we see more perch and, and, and rock bass. And then we have some really cool forage species which I uh, don't get talked about very much, but are actually uh, rare on the landscape than, than um, you might expect, but we have very, very strong populations of some really cool forest species, uh, the white sucker and uh, shorthead greater silver and gold and red horse. Uh, these make large seasonal migrations up the river and spawn uh, in the river itself, and then drop back down to the lake basins to live the rest of the year out. Um, and they're, they're fly and, and eggs fry and young uh, provide good forage for everybody else above them. Um, and then we have the Cisco, which uh, you might not hear much about. They spend most of their life out in the open water base and they acquire cold oxygen water again. Um, and I'll touch on a few of those examples here in a second. And then we have a myriad of various different minnow species. This is yeah, to be a member of China, but we have goldens, commons, blood nose, spot tails. We've got um, bog perch and Johnny darters and Iowa darters. And and a diversity of different species that really don't uh, receive a lot of recognition, but it's, it's really neat that we have a very, very diverse fish community here. Um, and I think the quality and the resilience of our of our uh, predator populations reflects uh, the diversity of the lower lower end of the food chain. Um, so that's important going forward as well. But um, I want to move into some of the some of the more minor differences and get into some of the um, more specific fisheries here. Uh, some of the some of the more minor differences that we see. Uh, would be uh, shoreline riparian development. Okay, this we see development along gradient throughout the Turtle River system, uh, but it impacts everywhere. So some lakes have more development than others. Uh, but again, remember what happens in the water in one lake then flows in the lake and goes downstream. So maybe you don't have a lot of development on one particular lake, but you got to look upstream uh, to see how impacts might um, might be might be had. We also see these lakes, again, from the top of the watershed down to the bottom, sitting at different landscape positions. And as such, and with different uh, glacial till deposits around, you see a, a, a variation in what type of uh, littoral habitats we have, what type of sediment it is. And this has really large implications then for uh, what happens in the domestic littoral zone um, and what happens in, in the upland with, of course, we have to have improvement to the near shore areas. Uh, what type of vegetation, how much can survive in that given littoral area, and how much development might um, influence uh, all of those. So the more major differences here among these lakes um, are really the morphometry of depth. And these are this is what really separates that very cohesive fish community structure down in more localized uh, different fishing opportunities and, and different fisheries that are provided by each lake. And so we have our riverine lakes. It might be an old, an old oxbow. It might be just a widening in the river. It might be an old lake basin, relatively small. But these small lakes, this is a picture of, of rice here, or part of rice. Um, they're relatively shallow. They're relatively warm, very riverine in nature, um, a lot of throughput, a lot of soft sediment, and, and a lot of vegetation. Then we have what I'll call the shallow lakes. And these are not necessarily biological terms you might find in a textbook, but uh, this is what kind of, this is how these lakes break down for me when I think about the different fish. Um, shallow lakes we see, again, shallower water. The biggest thing here is that we, we see expansive with coral habitat. So we see sprawling of shallow water um, uh, near the riparian area, and that really harbors um, a, a diversity of substrates for one, although dominated normally by sand, sand and silt. Um, and that supports uh, an awful lot of education. That's important to remember as we go forward as well. And then we have our deeper basin lakes. Uh, this happens to be pike, uh, where we see expansive open water. We see colder water, um, which is a tend to see clearer water. And uh, here we have a lot steeper drop offs and firmer substrates, more rock, and a lot less vegetation relative to how much uh, water volume is there. So, um, you can kind of test my, my work here. Um, 
If I break all the Turtle River lakes and put them in these different categories, the riverine lakes would be Lake of Falls, Bryce, Oxbow, Little Oxbow, Catherine. Uh, the shallow lakes being Fisher, Mercer, Van Cory, Jekyll, Long, Rainbow, and maybe No Man's Head, then on No Man's, but um, Deep Basin Lakes then being TFF, True, Pike, Cedar, Spider, North, uh, North and South Turtle, and Rock. And the fisheries then are a direct reflection of these habitats that exist in these lakes. And that's, that's very important to remember. And if we work through these, um, if, we, if we take a look at these riverine lakes, again, they're very shallow, warm, and lots of vegetation. And what we see these really serving as in the, in the, in the, in the overall fish community is these are nurseries. These are nurseries for game fish, um, primarily dominated by muskies, pike, and largemouth bass. Um, the warmer water and vegetation, these species do really, really well. And we tend to see a lot of very small panfish. And that's because, again, there's a lot of vegetation, a lot of complex refuge for those fish to survive. See, this big, it's a really good place to be. Well, it just so happens there are a lot of them there. Um, also, good place for these pike and muskies to figure it out. Just go have our babies there and then slide back downstream and go eat. Eat, uh, eat forage elsewhere. What you tend to see here is actually as well, you see a lot of biomass wrapped up in these larger, more rivery forage species like red horse and white suckers. So that detracts a little bit from more biomass being stacked in higher in the food web. Um, but you do see large seasonal migrations. So what you, what you tend to see in, in these populations is anywhere from a, a 10 to 30% influx of adults. So we'll see fish like muskies come up, come up into come up into rice, <coughs> spawn, and go back downstream. Um, or you'll see in, in boogie as it gets warm and as the vegetation comes up, those adults go seek cooler water in less complex habitat elsewhere. And then in the fall, when the temperatures start to cool down and you get dieback going on with that vegetation, you see an influx of these predators coming back to feed on. All these babies that have all survived while that vegetation is high and complex. Then we see shallow lakes, which uh, provide really uh, a much more stable and really, really high quality musky fishery. We see some of the best musky fisheries around. Uh, you know, higher county water along the Turtle River system and some of the highest natural recruitment rates of muskies anywhere in the world, um, which most people have a problem with. We sure don't here. Um, so we see really, really strong uh, action musky fisheries here. Um, some trophy potential, but primarily uh, just a really solid, stable population. Um, pike kind of take a back seat to the muskies. Again, these, these shallow lakes tend to offer really, really good largemouth populations um, and, and actually really marginal walleye fish. So these populations, again, we're, we're dealing with expansive littoral habitats, lots of sand, a lot of vegetation, generally warmer water, and that spells problems for walleyes. And so we see that we've been stocking these lakes for the last 30, 40, 50 years, and they never come up. And they don't reproduce little if ever. And so while they might survive and you might see some really nice fish in them from time to time, for the most part, they're really marginal walleye fishes. Um, we see really, really strong panfish populations. And in the absence of a really strong walleye population, we tend to see really good crappie populations. Um, and again, we see we see uh, these these species, white suckers and red horse, kind of uh, doubling down. While we see more the diverse uh, minnow species really ramping up. So we see a lot more diversity in in predator species there. And then in our deep basin lakes, these really provide a trophy muskie opportunity. Uh, we tend to see slightly less uh, recruitment in these systems. Um, but they're accompanied with uh, a, a, a very strong naturally reproducing, uh, generally an action walleye fishery, uh, self-sustained populations, might tend to take a back seat, um, and we tend to see really, really strong smallmouth populations. Again, in these systems, we tend to see because of that expansive cold water habitat and firmer substrates, we tend to see strong open water forage populations like perch and cisco. Um, so we can make subtle tweaks in, in these fisheries, um, and, and I realize that not all these, not all the lakes along the Turtle River are going to fall into these three broad categories. But from a management perspective, they they, they kind of tend to. Um, you're probably sitting there, some of you thinking, "Well, I don't want my lake to be in that category." 
Um, and I totally understand that. That's why my phone rings. And so I, I recognize that they don't fit in those categories. And I'll also say that, that these link habitats change in time. Uh, I think we're all well aware of that. And I'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, but more frequently, stakeholders, public, the people that use the fisheries, they want to shift things one way or another. I'm going to say, well, yeah, I don't, I don't really, you know, I'd much rather have a trophy musky opportunity than an action musky fishery. Or, oh, I'd rather have, I'd rather have northern pike than smallmouth bass any day. Or, I'd rather have walleye than largemouth bass, which is what I hear all the time. Um, and that's, and that's, and that's, that's totally understandable. And so we can make subtle tweaks here and there to try to, uh, to turn things to favor one species over another. Uh, one thing we can do is change the regulation. Bear in mind, you can change all the regulations you want, but you got to have a population to protect and a viable, a viable self-sustaining population uh, to work with before regulation can really work for it. Secondly, we can stock. We talked a little bit about this already, but uh, stocking only goes as far as the quality of the habitat that you're going to fish into. And so in some of these warmer waters, more vegetation, it's very, very difficult uh, to have stock fish with walleyes survive. So then we try to tweak the habitat. Well, we can go out and we can do all the habitat work that we want, but I'm not going to get real far with, with my crew. And even if we all went out to a particular lake and tried to influence the habitat in a 200, 300 acre lake, we're not going to get very far. Uh, it's been shown that these types of habitat efforts can be relatively effective on smaller systems, like say 20 to 50 acres. You start getting into bigger, more complex systems and you're, you're fighting drivers that are uh, on, a, on a much larger scale than we can ever, we can ever um, handle. Uh, it's hard to play the hands of God. And so <clears throat> while we can make those subtle tweaks, I want to touch on some of the larger, more impactful drivers of these systems that, that kind of, I think, will point to the fact that some of these things are out of our reach, and so we need to take a step back and take a look at the bigger picture um, in order to assess what you want to do to try to steer a fishery one way or another. One thing is the natural aging of lakes. Matt Wilson touched on this a little bit. Since the last glaciation period, we've been seeing this slow but general process happen in all of our lakes. They tend to. Uh, we've, had, we've had wind and wind and water, rain, and ice, and snow, work on the landscape around us, filling in the low spots, right? The water goes downhill. Um, so does everything else. Um, goes downhill and fills in our lakes. That's what happens. And it's, it's called the process of eutrophication. We tend to be uh, sending up higher nutrients over time, more sediment, more plants. They fill in less volume, less open water space. Um, and so this is the natural aging progression, progression of our lakes. This is what's going to happen. Um, again, that happens on the order of hundreds of thousands of years. Um, but we do things to kind of speed that process up. Uh, we do a lot of things that, that have similar repercussions, um, although done slightly differently. And in this area, that means logging. Um, so obviously, we had saw some pictures of the cutover uh, from the early 1900s, late 1800s, and that that can that can have great uh, implications for sediment runoff and uh, nutrient loading into our system. Today, we have better management practices uh, for for doing that work with having fewer impacts, uh, but still a large impact in the region, no doubt. Um, Shoreline development. This is a big one. This is again. This is right at right at the interface between uh, shore and the water, and right next to a lot of those really critical spawning habitats um, and and the areas that can harbor a lot of vegetation um, in our lakes. And so when we see building happen happening, that's fine. And again, we have best management practices to follow here as well. Uh, but you're just going to see more runoff, and you're going to see more nutrient loading, and you're going to see erosion occur, and it's going to put more fines down in that littoral zone um, and have an impact on the fishery through altering the habitat. And then finally, we have climate, climate change. And this is, uh, this is really, obviously we can't do a whole lot about this um, with respect to the fisheries right now, but we see uh, larger weather events, more frequent weather events, which means more erosion, which means more nutrient loading, which means uh, a lot of these same impacts uh, just on, on a much faster scale. Um, and then finally, to top it all off, if it's not an uphill battle enough for our, for our fisheries, uh, AIS come in and, and, and just add a few extra competitors to deal with. So if we revisit this again, what we tend to see with these, with these major drivers, um, 
in the open water areas, we tend to see that open water, that oxygenated band of thermocline, we tend to see that erode and disappear, which means that we can, we, in, in an iron county especially, um, our thermoclines are very, very narrow. Our, our, our Cisco's live in an area about this wide throughout the summer. In, in July and August, and now even in September, they live in about three feet of water. That's not much to eke out a living for a very long period of time. And so while Zach talks about how our water uh, quality is, we're looking pretty good, we're looking pretty good for now, but we don't have much room for error. So that's really important to think about with our open water species. And, and it's not just Cisco, because this has implications for yellow perch in, in May and June, as well as walleyes in June and July. And so uh, if, if you want to think about walleyes um, and you want to think about having trophy walleyes or self-sustaining populations, it's important to, to think about nutrient loading in, in these lakes. Um, same thing goes for spawning substrates, uh, all, these, all this erosion, and development, and siltation of fines, or siltation of fines covering a lot of our coarse cobble and rock in our near shore areas, uh, makes it harder for walleyes to make it go up and spawn. Um, and all of that, all that siltation and erosion leads to more vegetation near, to near shore areas, which really tips the scales towards largemouth bass and, and northern pike and a lot of our fisheries and bluegills. Um, generally speaking, that's not what our stakeholders want to see. And then, of course, with development pressures, we tend to see the removal, of course, when you have debt, the removal of near shore uh, or riparian wood uh, and lack of recruitment to the lake, um, further decreasing foraging opportunities for predators. Um, so we tend to see we tend to see a lake that looks like this in northern Wisconsin, you know, in the 40s and 50s, a nice pristine lake uh, with buffered shorelines, uh, diverse habitats, and and a well-balanced predator-dominated fishery uh, to a developed uh, eutrophic um, lake with, with uh, highly trophic lake with, with uh, prey-dominated fisheries. Um, so the largest hurdles, if you haven't picked up on it yet, uh, largest hurdles that I see us facing in our fisheries and turtle river system are really erosion, nutrient loading, increased water temperature, uh, and invasive species. And so I could sit here and talk to you about human habitat work. I could sit here and talk to you about stocking. I could talk to you about the regulations we're going to change. None of those would amount to a hill of beans if we can't get the habitat right. First of all, preserving what we have and then trying to chip away and go the other way. And that's, that's, that's a tall order. But um, there are a few things that we can do. And, and um, most people think that this is kind of out of your grasp, but it's very, very simple stuff. And a lot of it is really not that expensive. A lot of it has to do with, one, improving, improving repairing buffers. Yeah, all you have to do is not mow the lawn. That's not very expensive to do. Um, stabilize shoreline. Some of these projects, you do that through planting vegetation um, and, and in, in lower energy areas and in the higher ener energy areas, maybe doing uh, some, some sort of uh, bank stabilization. Um, planting trees will get you there too, not only stabilizing soils, but also providing shade. And in our neck of the woods, our water gets really, really hot. And those trees can get really, really tall, cast a little shadow, and allow for less solar energy going into our water, which only benefits our cool and cold water species. Um, so I think there's a bunch of information that's talked about some of the cost sharing programs. I encourage you to take a look at those. Um, and finally, again, think about the fact that water flows downhill um, and, and work with work with folks upstream to achieve your goals in your lake and try to be a neighbor, a good neighbor. And think about where your water is going down. Uh, so, with that, I thank you. If our panelists could come to the front of the room, we'll field some questions. Um, I wanted to thank Teresa Schmidt for running our uh, running our Zoom session and facilitating the program. Today. Better helps the poster uh, with the map of uh, the, the River Chain of Lakes. And uh, thank you to Arun for uh, helping to publicize that. Uh, the, uh, the Rice Lake Association put a uh, flyer together. It's on the back, on the back table as well. And uh, it's a
one of those up. But uh, questions from the audience for our group. Before we do that, they think I didn't talk enough, so I thought I'd see it. <laughs> uh, Alex Sell is our AIS regional coordinator. So I'm on the county, he's our regional coordinator. I asked him to come down to also help some AIS questions. Thank you, Alex, for being here. And questions for our, our panelists. Sometimes dinner and coffee. <laughs> yes. Um, First and foremost, I'm really hoping that you can bring out of today some sort of an organizational effort to get everybody on the same page so that next year when we get back in our community and paddle up the river, we've got more help. So um, I'm not sure how to do that, but I'm really hoping that that's something that comes out of it. That wasn't a question, it was a statement. <laughs> <laughs> and I think when it comes to uh, CLPs, we need more tools. Uh, I, I guess I kind of help answer that. Um, it is a task, and uh, we're running out of energy, we're running out of uh, tools, and I would agree with Steve, but I think learning what other lakes have done, working with the DNR surface water uh, grants. There's some funding opportunities there. Uh, talking to our lake biologists, seeing what other tools um, are out there is, is a good thing, whether they're able, we're able to use them or not. So I think this is a start also to explore some tools. And it totally depends on your population size, location, where it is to other populations. They're all going to be different. Um, so sometimes hand pulling is exactly what you need. And then a lot of times it's going to be other other forms or methods of removal. Gentlemen? I've been in water resource management for 30 years. In 40 years, we only look, should be looking at the past. So when Purple Loose Strike first took over, started spreading throughout the state before we had a biological control, there was some. A friend of mine suggested one to put a crew together based on one thing. I'm wondering if you have ever considered this tool. But when you burn purple loose strike, and I'm not sure that it doesn't apply to other aquatic invasives, when they bloom, if you could burn it with a torch, it'll kill the whole plant. Has that been considered in the state of Wisconsin? I mean, but so going off of uh, the other gentleman's question as well in the state, we like to use this phrase, or I guess I call it line of thought called integrated pest management, which just kind of shows that we don't we use every tool that's kind of available. So when you're talking about fire, um, I work with our wildlife biologists and folks to manage coastal wetlands and things like that. And so fire is one of those tools that we're kind of looking at rather than utilizing herbicide or things like that. I know we've used uh, drift torches for buckthorn removal down in the White River Fisheries area, um, kind of uh, by the Delta Diner, if anyone knows where that is down in Batesville County. Um, so fire is absolutely a, a tool that um, is utilized, and it, it kind of really depends on the, the situation, I guess I would say, because um, it can provide positives and mitigate species, but it can also kind of exasperate additional problems in those areas and kind of expand a population or a species that you're not necessarily wanting to expand, whether it be native or not. Native. In, the second, I, in the second part, I, I'm sorry, the second part made me think of this already. All your methods that you talk about, whether they're subaquatic or emerging or whatever, and we I never heard once mentioned um, replacing native plants or seeding native plants after you remove a uh, aquatic invasive or or above. You know, uh, where where are we on that? Uh, oh, for example, cool. like yellow iris, we were targeting these sparse outliers that the native plants are dense enough around them they're going to fill in and now we're moving to the phase where we have these large areas that were all yellow iris that we're going to put in all new native plants and erosion control materials and some um soils and stuff to help uh and and contribute to the plant growth and succession of of seasons so that's absolutely to be considered um on a lot of projects 
The other yeah. thing we learned with the purple loose strike project on the proflammable foliage is we were using herbicide and we noticed some dieback of woody debris, woody, woody uh, habitat. And um, some we noticed a recanary grass coming filling in in these places that were treated. Uh, hence why we went to the hand point effort. We're seeing a better result without less uh, residual effects from the herbicide. And to comment on fire, I think it is an absolutely underutilized method um, with humans today for managing habitats across the board, not just purple leaf strike. So developing, you know, more initiatives to do that with adjacent species would be important. And, and when it comes to like your your more upland wetland species, those are a lot of the ones that are a lot easier to educate um, comparatively. So there's not a lot of folks out there who are growing your um, native aquatic macrophytes or your other pond weeds out there. So it's kind of hard to plant something that we don't have a good uh, source that's not super expensive as well. So like. For instance, like we've done some manure or wild rice restoration. It was actually more cost effective for us to go out there and rice down in Burnett County and then bring that back up to the St. Louis estuary and reseed it in that sense, rather than buying it in some other different methods as well. So the, the hurdles of cost and, and effort are always playing the things as well. So. Kevin? Um, going back to Cindy's um, comments about trying to have uh, a good connection, I would really like to that to the land and water conservation department, but we would rely on all of the lake associations to help with that. So we have a list, um, but it's it's very, very outdated. There's current officers, um, individual lake associations contact or their website. So I would really urge all of you that are a part of the lake association to contact your that or I and we can update that and we need to have that on our uh, land and water website. addition to that, uh, one easy way is if you're a president or vice president of the Lake Association, if you first go to the DNR website in their Lake Association page, then I can also extract it. But we, we are way behind it because every year there's a turnover of presidency and then I can't, I lose that contact and that communication. Diane? Um, I think, you know, we're talking about big infestations all the time, but I mean, I go out there and I learn about all these plants, right? And I'm running and I'm in the woods, you know, running on the road, you're in the woods all the time. And I found one uh, of those um, parsnip plants on the road and you took care of it before it got out of hand. I found a few uh, buckthorns at Lake of the Falls County Park and you took care of that before it got bad. Um, if people just started to learn, about these plants that are potential, you know, there's a list of probably 10 that are potentially bad. And people would just start looking around instead of waiting for somebody else to do it. You know, we would stop from having these big infestations like the, one, the garlic mustard over in Hurley. If those people would have known what it looked like, it could have been taken care of years ago. I, I would you know? like to add on to that. Not only if you have one parsnip or one purple loose stripe plant, it, I want to know about it, but it would really help me if you just pulled it. <laughs> uh, because my list is growing and I can't tell you how many times I've pulled purple loose stripe between somebody's boards on their dock. And I'm, it's like that education part, like help me, help the Lake Associations, help us because I can't physically remove them. And I love it when they say, oh, thanks for educating us. We'll take care of it. That's the scenario we want. <laughs> and, and from that standpoint, I don't know about Zach or Jamie or other folks, but I love native aquatic plants and especially submergent aquatic macrophytes. So if there's things that you don't know, like living on your lake in your area, like you know those areas better than any of us possibly could. 
So if there's ever something that you think like, oh, I've never seen this before, I'm just kind of curious what it is, send them to us. And like, I would gladly look at 85 I love photos. I love being pictures of plants. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'll, I'll, yeah, rather than one person not sending us a picture of an invasive because they're not 100% sure of what it is. So um, from that standpoint, like by all means, send stuff our way. High quality pictures. <laughs> yeah. More than one. As well. <laughs> With scale too, if there's anything. Well, you were talking about putting in the plants to your site so you can actually eliminate the dead and that came to our house. And I'm on Grand Floyd who had yellow iris. It was really bad. Jack and his guys, people came and did a lot of work and got a lot out. And now they're not coming back. And I'm there and I'm pulling out what I find, what I can get to. But it's still coming back from the original heavily treated area. It's still under there. You know, even though we've tarped over and it's been treated. I had one last year where I pulled out a, a wood, a rhizome, about that long that was way back in underneath the tarp where we tarped it up and it was growing out into the lake. So I don't understand how I can replace when it's still there, it isn't going away. So, so one the biggest lesson when it deal, when we're dealing with invasive species is education awareness. The the mottos on the sign, um, you know, draining your boat, cleaning, drying, never move. Prevention is the best tool. Once you get it, we need to get on the little populations right away. But it rarely ever goes away. And it's constant management and it's adaptation. Uh, no matter what we do, it uh, when it's gone for 10 years, that's a win. And maybe on the 11th year, it'll come back. <laughs> uh, but that, let's keep it out first. Sure. And notice over time, that a lot of your bases, there's, there's a, as I said, there's a native plant. Okay, you're raising a little Millfoil and foil is a lot like our native millfoil. Okay, blue flag iris is a lot about like our yellow iris. So, why don't we recognize that that happening and use these as tools to compete with those other plants? For okay. example, blue frog iris, we completely avoid it because then the homeowner can't tell which one they have when it's re sprouting. So it makes it difficult unless it's in flower. And if it's re-sprouts from a stressed plant, it might not flower that year. Um, you, can't, you can't easily identify which one it is after that, for iris specifically. And there's a couple, few dozen other wonderful plants that will heavily compete with it too. Um, you just, it's persistence. You have to continue to pull those out. And then also to answer your question, the Iron County Land and Water Conservation Department has been doing it for like 20 years. We have a native plant sale, tree and shrub sale. We offer a whole variety of beautiful, really cool native plants. Get a hold of us in late January, February, buy our plants, they're cheap. Plant them on your shore. We do it. We encourage it. Um, it's super fun. If you like plants and butterflies and all the other benefits, so we have been doing it and we're we're promoting it and along with the shoreline restoration grants and the expertise to to call the experts from um, the department out to your property to get advice planning do you know exactly when that order form is going to show up for those meetings uh i wait till after the first year yeah. Libraries. Yeah. Um, we usually have them, yeah. We, we try to have them at the front desk and post them on our bulletin board when they're out. Any other questions? Well, let's uh, give our panelists a round of applause. Yeah, thank you all very much. Uh, as I said, uh, the Rice Lake Association has been a sponsor. Um, pick up their flyer. Uh, if you have a donation bucket, I think it's still on the back uh, table. 
And, uh, and oh, you can go to their website, which is right here, plateassociation.org. Yeah. And I'll learn about the next step. But I'm not just a way to talk about it. So, yeah. Yeah, okay.